um, That's fine. good afternoon and thank you for being our first speaker. If you're able um, to share your screen, that will be fantastic and you can get yeah. going. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Off you go. Hi. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Neji Jocho. I'm one of the registrar in uh, acute medicine working in the Southern Hospital. Together with me, my colleague, Dr. Asma Chowdhury, who is also registrar in endocrinology, and my uh, consultant, Dr. Ali Rato, in endocrinology, will help me to the presentation. Today, um, first of all, I would like to thank to the team who select our case to present in today. Um, pituitary masterclass. Um, our case heading is unusual cause of uh, diabetes insipidus presenting during pregnancy. So the case is um, 38 year old woman who presented to us with the polyuria and polydipsia for nearly seven months. And these symptoms started during the uh, that time is, that trimester of her second pregnancy. And then um, these symptoms resolved immediately after the normal delivery of her healthy baby. However, it restarted again in a few weeks later, and then the symptoms are persistent from then. Um, so in terms of her symptoms, her daily fluid intake uh, fluctuated between three to seven liters a day, and also associated with the significant nocturia about three to four times a night. Apart from these symptoms, uh, she didn't complain of any other systemic symptoms and there is no weight changes at all. So in terms of her past medical history, uh, she had a pseudomyxoma peritoneae of the appendix. Um, the tumor was excised in 2014. After that, she was under ongoing surveillance for the tumor. And also she had a two laparoscopy surgery for her endometriosis. And for medication history, she was not on any other regular medication except um, progesterone only pills, serazels, and her periods are quite scanty and absence, which is expected with the, this pill. So on clinical examination, um, she's generally unremarkable and she's not overloaded or dehydrated. She's totally euvolumic and blood pressure was around 144 over 98 and her body weight is just 76.1 kg. So for the initial blood test investigation, we first rule out diabetes mellitus for this polyuria polydipsia symptoms. So you can see that the first thing, plasma glucose is quite normal and hemoglobin A1C is within normal limit. And also we rule out the hypercalcemia and you can also see that adjusted calcium is around 2.5. In terms of the serum electrolytes, uh, it's more or less normal, uh, but the serum sodium slightly higher. Uh, upper limit of the normal. And when you see the serum osmolality is like higher than the normal range is 297. And also with the significant low urine osmolality about 104 millimole per kg. And urine sodium is around 21.6 millimole per liter. So apart from these baseline investigation, we also arranged the other anterior pituitary hormone profiles which all you can see that these all are within um, normal limit, uh, thyroid hormone, free T4, TSH, and also prolactin, also normal range, and early morning cortisol and IGF-1 profile are all normal range. So with this baseline investigation, our diagnosis is likely diabetes insipidus. So we erased the water deprivation test um, to rule out the primary polydipsia. So the, this is the water deprivation test part one. So, so you can all see that her body weight is uh, 75.8 in initial. And the first urine sample and plasma sample, uh, plasma osmolality was around uh, 289 and urine osmolality is 87. Urine osmolality is gradually going up to the, uh, the 323 in that sample and also serum osmolality growing up to 301 in that sample. And also the urine volume was first quite high in the first few hours and then slightly going down. And the body weight was around slightly going down to um, 74.3 from 75.8. 
and also the serum sodium is also is is maintained around upper limit of the normal so after we got that that sample of urine and plasma osmolality we stopped the first test because of the serum osmolality more than 300 and then we start giving the desmopressin and after that a urine osmolality set so this is the water deprivation test part two. And after the desmopressin, the urine osmolality rose to 4A5 and peak at 614, and are slightly going down to 4A4, and urine volume is slightly low. So in terms of the interpretation to this water deprivation test, firstly, so the serum osmolality, it was about 301 in that plasma and with corresponding urine osmolality with 323, which gave us a ratio of uh, U3B3 ratio of 1.07, which is less than 1.9 and supporting the diagnosis of the cranial GI. And also the after desmopressin, um, urine osmolality rose to 614, which is more than 150 rise of the previous highest value 323 and also this is also support the diagnosis of cranial DI. And then, and in this case, diabetes insipidus, we assume it's partial because as maximum urine concentration after dehydration is just above 300. So in this step, uh, our working diagnosis is partial cranial diabetes insipidus is most probably due to the secondary lymphocytic hypophysitis because she first presented in the pregnancy, late pregnancy. And also we started the treatment on the desmopressin and, and then for the further step, we arranged the MRI picture tree. Right, this is the um, suggestive view of the MRI picture tree with pre-contrast and post-contrast. So as all you can see that there is a, a reported the cystic lesion about measuring about seven into five millimeter, which is same ISO in intensity with the pituitary gland and also non-contrast uh, non enhancement in the lesion. And it is quite free from the stock and posterior pituitary also appear normal apart from that. And this is the uh, another view, uh, view of the MRI picture tree, and all you can see that this is pre-contrast and post-contrast, and which you can clearly see that the lesion is totally clear from the chiasma. So. After we got this MRI picture tree, we discussed the case with the neurosurgery. And then neurosurgery considered that, uh, the firstly, the spread from her previous uh, seromisoma, but it is extremely rare condition. And also this picture tree abnormality is more likely benign lesion. So it was planned to discuss at the pituitary MDT, and then meanwhile uh, for the active monitoring and plan to repeat the MRI pituitary in three months and to review with the MRI, repeat MRI. So this is also the neurosurgical MDT outcome. So they agree that the findings are keeping with the my diabetes insipidus, and this imaging findings are keeping with the posterior pituitary area and with also non enhancing cystic lesions. And also, radiologists report for the lesion is separate from the stalk. So, at the point, the so diagnosis is unclear, and also MDD agree for the active monitoring from now. So interestingly, this is a three months MRI and patient recently had this MRI last week. So, so you can see that um, this is a previous imaging uh, cystic lesion and now this is three months lesion. So all, it is quite clear that the lesion is uh, slightly increasing in sight and it's raising from the size seven to 11 millimeter in dimension, and also studded uh, minimally intended to the object chiasma. And you can also compare in the surgical view either. So, so this is the first imaging, and also the slide, slide is quite small, and now size is slightly getting bigger, and slightly intended to the object chiasma. So, so the follow-up imaging is 
shown that uh, side is getting increased seven millimeter to 11 millimeter and now is contact with the chiasma now. So, and when we ask the patient, the patient also reports uh, wasn't in half her symptoms despite she's having regular desmopressin. pressing. Um, so, I'm going to end my presentation uh, with the three questions. Sorry. It's the slightest. Uh, uh, excuse me. Um, so, so I would like to, yeah, so end my presentation with three questions for you. So the first question is, sorry, the slide is not coming up now. So I, I'll ask you the question. So what is the nature of uh, this posterior pituitary lesion? And the second question is, why is this patient present in the, in the late pregnancy? And the third question is, um, so should we do any surgery to improve the symptoms or to get the diagnosis? Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, yes. So lots of questions on the chat. If I just look at the chat for a second, um, I was looking to see whether, thank you, Corinne, uh, they're the three questions. What is the nature of the posterior pituitary lesion? I was trying to see if we had, I know one of our neuroradiologists was going to join, but I couldn't see his name. Have we got any neuroradiologists on who would like to uh, talk to us about the imaging. I couldn't, I can't remember from our graph at the beginning if we've got a neuroradiologist here. Is there anyone here at all? I don't think um, Luke's joined us actually yet. Okay. Well, in the meantime, what is the nature of this posterior pituitary lesion? Uh, Nigel, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I saw that you'd popped onto the meeting. Um, and I suppose we've got this cystic pituitary lesion in a patient who is now postpartum um, and, is, and, and, and we've attributed her cranial diabetes insipidus to uh, her cystic pituitary, pituitary lesion. Well, yes, the pituitary cystic lesion. Yeah. What, were your, mean, what would your thoughts be about whether or not that was a correct uh, hypothesis and whether or not it would be amenable to surgery? Oh, well, the stalk lesion itself wouldn't be. The cystic lesion is. But the, the scan that I saw, the second scan, which seemed the cystic was getting large, the cystic component was getting larger, seemed to be then in continuity with the extension of the pituitary stalk. So initially I thought this might be, why isn't this a lymphocytic hypophysitis with isolated pituitary stalk lesion? I mean, you'll, ever, you'll only ever find out what the nature is if you're able to get a, di a, a biopsy. I don't think we biopsy the stalk in itself without progressive change. Now that the tumour seems to be getting bigger, I think there will become a case for surgery if, she develops a, if it progresses in, in size and gets carsmal compression. Okay, and the cystic lesion, Nigel, could you um, do something where you aspirate it rather than you, or not, would you actually resect really. it? Not really, I mean, uh, cystic lesions, if they're, for example, arachnoids, they tend to just re recur, you end up with a CSF leak. Mm. So I just wouldn't drain the cyst. You'd explore it to see whether there's a capsule to it and try to remove it. Okay, thank you. Um, the second question I was interested in, and um, maybe the problem with that, James, is I'm so sorry, but because I can't see the last slide, I can't write down the questions as well. But I'm sorry. Get Corinne to, <laughs> I was to, get Corinne to try and put that up. Um, I wanted to ask the second question about why did the patient's symptoms start during late pregnancy? It was such an interesting case because I wondered whether or not in pregnancy and I can see some people um, in the discussion like Alison Wren for example who's got lots of experience with um, um, obstetric medicine and Sheba Jervis is also on the on the meeting and I just wondered if anyone had any thoughts I've never seen it about um, pregnant diabetes or insipidus of pregnancy which obviously commonly presents in the third trimester and I wondered if anyone had any thoughts I know that because this presumably came back postpartum in terms of her symptoms, that that's why we went down a pituitary route. But I wondered if you'd entertain the idea about um, diabetes insipidus of pregnancy originally, and that, that you know, that sort of vasopressin A's from the placenta. Uh, can I ask Joe to just share that the slide again? The speaker. Oh, yes. Yeah, just share oh. that and go back to it so we can all see it. It'll override this. Yeah. yeah. 
Sorry. You didn't want to answer that question that you put forward. I mean, there's yeah. certainly, sorry, it's Alison here. I mean, there, there certainly are vasopressinases in the placenta yeah. that can um, increase requirements for DDAVP in people who have already got DI or precipitate or push people into DI if they've got, you know, partial um, DI. So, so I certainly that would be reasonable to be a component of why this lady presented when she did. And she did only have partial cranial DI, didn't she? Because she could partially concentrate her urine. Thank you, Alison. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but it's just it's I've never right. seen it. <laughs> that was marvellous. I've never seen it, you see, and I don't see many don't see many pregnant women. So, I don't think uh, I've seen it presenting de novo in pregnancy. I, I think it's pretty uh, rare, but I certainly have seen people with pre-existing DI having increasing requirements and, and, you know, we anticipate that and warn them about that in later pregnancy. Thank you. That's fantastic. I wonder if I could throw a curveball into the discussion, please, which is, um, I wondered whether or not we were truly confident in the DI diagnosis, because it was a tricky one, wasn't it? And I wondered if anyone had any thoughts about, I know from the one of the questions from the chat was, could we look at copeptin? And obviously not everyone has that facility to, to do, be able to do that. But in terms of, I know that you stopped the test because her plasma osmolality got up to 301. And she I wondered whether or not that, that meant you had um, real time osmolalities, which, which are helpful in terms of when you're doing water depth. But I wondered whether <clears throat> if you'd have left her for a bit longer, um, whether, she would have concentrated a bit more and I'd be interested what people's thoughts are diagnostically around whether or not we were truly confident that, that this was the eye which had persisted post-pregnancy because it looked tricky that's all. Um, can you see your hands up? Can you see your hands? Yeah. Sorry I'll, I'll, I'll take this question. Um, I think that's fine. Yeah. Sorry, share screen. Sorry. There were two hands up, Nee. Can you see them? Yeah. yeah. And you're on mute. Sorry, uh, I can't see them. Hang on. Can I, one of the hands is mine, Ganesh Nagi. I'm a retired endocrinologist. And I just oh, yes, please go for it. I just wanted to raise the possibility that similar presentation has been reported before in people with localized pituitary abscess. Um, I mean, hydroxyamine would be over 100, isn't it, if it's not being cut? Sorry, um, I'll them. Carry on. And the radiological findings could fit in very well, and these people generally present with BI alone. Um, and, uh, you know, it would fit in um, uh, as to the diagnosis. I think we should consider that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'm so sorry, I've been very ignorant about the hands. James, you've also got a hand up. So James from James Alquist from South End, what would you like to say? I haven't met this patient, but I was interested to hear the story. I agree with Alison that the presentation in pregnancy would be very compatible with placental vasopressinase causing gestational diabetes insipidus and unmasking a mild latent condition. Like you, I wasn't that convinced about the water deprivation test, but there are patients who have a mild form of diabetes insipidus, where the diagnosis is harder to nail that way. Uh, a copeptin would be a reasonable thing to do. But I'm really interested in the expansion of the cyst, because I thought this was probably going to be a relatively benign static cyst, and yeah. that it would be simply a matter of monitoring. But given that it's increased in size by 50% and is close to the chiasm, I now think we need to monitor anterior pituitary function, possibly even reinvestigate to posterior, because if there is diabetes insipidus, it really narrows the diagnosis to some unusual conditions. And like Nigel, I think with the new scan, we might be going for a biopsy before too long just to find out. But we don't want to lose her, her anterior pituitary function from a biopsy when she's still got more children to have. So it isn't a simple decision to make. I'd be interested in the comments of others, though. Yeah, they're very good points, James. And, and you're quite right. Interestingly, a couple of years ago, in fact, it was our, la first, our last live meeting before COVID. Um, we had a debate actually on the pros and cons of pituitary biopsy. And you're quite right. There's lots to gain. I mean, certainly histological diagnosis, but balanced against compromise of anterior pituitary function, particularly in a woman of reproductive age. So I hear you. Um, 
I might just ask Dr. Ranthor, Rathor to comment because I know that you're last author on this and then we're going to move on to the next case if that's okay. So final comment from or question from Dr. Rathor, please. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to answer your question why we stopped at 301. Um, so I think this is just our guide, uh, so like protocol, which we follow from Hammersmith. Once the serum osmology goes above 300, uh, the test is stopped. Uh, and I think registrar supervising the test simply followed that uh, protocol. I think urine osmolarity wasn't available at the time. I think it came later. That's it. Thank you. No, thank you for clarifying. I think, I don't know if I, look, maybe it, it's only my confession, but I often find water deprivation tests really difficult actually to try and tease out. You know, you do a nice sort of example of ones for the medical students where it's all very clear, but often it's just quite difficult to unpick. So I was just exploring what we felt about how clear the diagnosis was or not. Uh, but thank you very much for clarifying. Well, listen, thank you. That was a great case from Southend to start with. Thank you very much. Just to make sure we're going to stick to time, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. And this is Dr. Gan, and she's going to share her slides. If you want to, Jasmine, if you want to share your slides now. Um, Dr. Gan was one of our core medical trainees on our endocrine ward last year. Um, and she um, has very kindly joined us this afternoon to talk about an interesting inpatient case that we had recently. Thank you, Jasmine. Okay, Justin, you can get going. Thank you. You need to unmute, Justin. Oh, there we are. Sorry about that. It's all right. All right. Hello there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jesslyn. I'm one of the medical registrars at Charing Cross Hospital. I work with the endocrinology team at Imperial. And today I'll be presenting a case on treating Cushing's disease and its complications a team effort from Ashford and St. Peter's Hospital and uh, Imperial. So this is a 72 year old gentleman with a background of ACTH dependent Cushing's syndrome worked up in clinic who presented with an 18 month history of significant weight gain and an eight week history of progressive fatigue, lower back pain secondary to vertebral compression fractures declining mobility due to leg weakness, easy bruising and poor wound healing. He was admitted to St. Peter's Hospital due to difficult to manage high pore kalemia. So he had clinical manifestations of Cushing syndrome on examination with facial plethora, interscapular fat pad, central obesity, extensive bruising, a shallow wound on his left shin, proximal myopathy that was severe, causing him to stand and to be chair bound. He also had thin skin. His biochemical investigations supported an ACTH dependent cortisol excess with secondary hypothyroidism and secondary hypogonadism with a high 9 a.m. cortisol of 1051 and a, nine, a high 9 a.m. ACTH and an overnight dexamethasone suppression test of 894. He had low testosterone, low FSH, LH, low free T4 and low TSH. So his pituitary MRI showed a pituitary macroadenoma extending into the supracellar cistern where it touches but does not distort the optic chiasm. Its maximum craniocaudal measurement on sagittal imaging is 17 millimeters. It touches the right cavernous sinus, but there is no invasion. And these images show that there is no associated signal change or edema in the visual pathway. He was started on metyrapone, spironolactone, and potassium supplementation. He was discussed at the Imperial Pituitary MDT meeting, which outcome was that there was a clear neurosurgical target concerns about high pore kalemia and significant proximal myopathy. 
So now I'm going to forward a question to the audience. Uh, so if you get meant to meet her up, does he need a inferior pituitary petrosal sign of something or an IPSS prior to a transvenoidal pituitary surgery? Yes or no? And now I'm going to hand over to uh, Prof Mirren for Mentimeter. Goodness, you can. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a very split audience. OK, so Jaslyn, we'll get out of Mentimeter and you can tell us. So the Imperial Pituitary MDT decision was to proceed with urgent pituitary surgery and not for inferior petrosal sinus sampling, given the pituitary macroadenoma on MRI with clear neurosurgical target and concerns about his presentation of hypokalemia and significant proximal myopathy. He was transferred that night to Charing Cross Hospital for his urgent pituitary surgery. While awaiting pituitary surgery on the wards, he developed acute abdominal pain with peritonism with increased inflammatory markers He was reviewed by the colorectal surgical team and proceeded to have a CT abdo pelvis, which showed free intra-abdominal fluid and bowel inflammation, which may be primary or reactive to the perforation with diffuse peritoneal inflammation. And the impression was that he had subacute bowel perforation likely related to high cortisol burden a cortisol of 1,227 nanomole per litre on metyrapone, 500 milligrams, three times a day at the time of the imaging. An interval CT showed increased volume of free intra-abdominal fluid. The free intra-abdominal fluid was drained under interventional radiology in the first instance, confirming pus. In view of the free pus drained, the colorectal surgical team advised for a diagnostic laparoscopy plus minus a laparotomy. There was an impressive collaborative surgical approach between both the neurosurgical and colorectal surgical teams. The patient had back-to-back -back operations in a single theater attendance with considerable planning required to plan this arrangement. So first he had his pituitary surgery uh, the transvenoidal resection of pituitary tumor performed by neurosurgery, followed by his abdominal surgery, the laparoscopic abdominal washout performed by colorectal surgery, both surgeries within the same anesthetic time. The patient improved significantly postoperatively with his cortisol levels falling over the next few days a day five cortisol of 235 nanomole per litre, 18 hours off any glucocorticoid. And his cortisol levels continued to fall postoperatively to 35 nanomole per litre, one month post-op, indicating remission of his Cushing's disease. The histology of the pituitary macroadenoma showed a densely granulated corticotroph adenoma with a KI67 index of less than 3%. He recovered from abdominal sepsis and was transferred back to St. Peter's Hospital for ongoing rehabilitation due to significant deconditioning from proximal myopathy and a prolonged hospital stay. So in summary, this is a 72 year old gentleman who had combined surgery for pituitary corticotroph adenoma and bowel perforation presumed secondary to hypercortisolism. And prompt treatment of cortisol excess was crucial to minimize the serious clinical complications associated with Cushing's disease. So a question for discussion today is, could the pituitary surgery have waited until the intra-abdominal sepsis had resolved or was it unavoidable due to the burden of complications related to cortisol excess? And with that, I thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn, that was lovely. Um, where in the bowels of perforation? Goodness, that's a very GI, <laughs> it's a very GI surgical question. And actually, can you remember, Jocelyn, where it was? We looked at I, it the other day. Was it sigmoid? I, it, there were multiple perforations. I was there but, when they did the laparoscopy. There were multiple adhesions and pus. It, was, you know, it wasn't one site. It's just very friable colon. 
Yes, and I think it was the friability of the colon in the context of that very high cortisol that obviously made everyone very nervous about bowel surgery full stop. And although he was consented for a laparotomy, had a diagnostic laparoscopy. And I think, you know, rightly in terms of, as I say, poor wound healing with that degree of cortisol burden, we wanted to do as little as possible whilst fix the bowel at the same time, if that makes sense. Um, any other questions? I'm just going to see, Karim, you, sh you shout to me if I've missed a hand, because I'm just going to look for hands for a minute. Um, or, or please unmute and shout out if anyone's got a question. So we've obviously got 50% uh, uh, with a yes and a no to the IPSS. Um, so there's a couple of questions about the management of the hypercortalism, which I'm happy to talk about. So I guess the 50-50 split we've got, first of all, just to talk about the IPSS, we really often do do an IPSS to um, exclude ectopic. And there was a question earlier on the chat um, there's actually considerable overlap in the ACTH levels between ectopic ACTH secretion and Cushing's disease. So you can't use the ACTH as a marker, really. Um, we, we often do do an IPSS, but as I think someone said in the chat, actually, in fairness, they're, they're quite old now. But the American Enterprise Society guidelines are that if you've got a macro with, um, uh, with confirmed ACTH dependent cushions, you don't actually have to have, an, have to do an IPSS. But I think the reasons that we were really swayed towards not doing an IPSS in this patient, um, and I'll let Nigel chip in too in a sec, is that the patient was actually really unwell. The hypokalemia was really difficult to manage. Um, he, he, could, he couldn't even stand up uh, from the degree of proximal myopathy that he had. And so really we, we got him across and did him very urgently in terms of trying to reduce that cortisol burden. And just the other quick questions about the cortisol management, then I'll be quiet. We escalated the metaripone quite quickly within about, uh, he, he was probably here for about 10 days before he was operated and we went up every couple of days. I want to say he was on something like one gram TDS just before his surgery. I have seen one other person have a bowel perforation before with Cushing's. It's not, uh, I think with severe Cushing's too. So I think with a very high cortisol burden, it can happen. A couple of people have asked about Atomidate, which is a GA agent, which also can uh, reduce cortisol secretion. I've used it once in an ITU setting, but it's also a respiratory depressant. So you can really only use it on an ITU setting and you have to be very mindful that it's really a very short term fix before surgery. And we weren't quite there with him, although that's because we were lucky enough to get two surgeons to make lots of uh, important discussions to, to get him into a joint surgery, really. Nigel, was there anything that you wanted to add at all? Yeah, I mean, I think this chap, well, this chap's clearly sick, and you can't optimise someone to making them any better for general anaesthetic by waiting a few days. His problem was his raised cortisol, and that was the thing that needed to be addressed urgently. And there's only one way to do that effectively, and that's pituitary surgery. Thank you, Nigel. And I think coming back to the um, laparotomy, I know that this is a pituitary meeting. When we've talked in the past to our um, endocrine surgeon Fausto Palazzo. I know certainly he's described to me before that when he sort of cuts into uh, into the to, to operate for a bilateral adrenalectomy in the context of Cushing's, he says it's like putting a knife through butter because actually there's so much uh, <clears throat> collagen uh, sort of not destruction, but you know sort of poor connective tissue, etc. So I think really what you want to do in this context is fix the abdomen with as little. Um, intervention as possible really which we were very lucky to achieve and um, I'm just I, I can't see any hands but if there are any other questions please do shout out we've probably got room for one or two before we go on to the next talk is there anyone else to say anything someone asked in the chat about the ACTH suggesting ectopic ACTH and I think this is a lesson an important learning point and that the number however high it is that was quite a big pituitary tumour. So pituitaries can make a lot of ACTH if they're big. There isn't a cutoff. I know there's statistics behind there, but um, okay, Dr. Ahmed has raised his hand. Uh, yeah, I'm Munir from uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, considering there was a possibility of this being an ectopic ACTH in security to me as well, wasn't a bilateral antilinectomy be a more safer and quick option uh, compared to pituitary surgery? Thank you. Um, it's a good question, and thank you for um, joining us all the way from Sri Lanka. That's really fantastic. Um, I think 
Look, there was all, I think, the first thing to say is that, as, as Krim just mentioned, and he's quite right, I can't remember the reference of the paper, there's a very nice graph which shows ACTH levels in Cushing's disease and ectopic ACTH, and there's a very clear overlap, so you can't use a single ACTH cutoff. Um, yes, of course, there's always a concern that you're, if you've not done an IPSS, that you haven't um, excluded ectopic ACTH secretion. So there was, I suppose, a degree of, of, of uncertainty, but we've got a macroadenoma on imaging. And we've also got a patient that I would argue, again, I, I'll listen to what Nigel says, he is a surgeon and I'm not, but operating and doing a bilateral adrenalectomy in someone that is this unwell, I think probably wouldn't have been the safer option. Um, I don't know what Nigel thinks about that, but I think really it was just to try and control the cortisol um, as, as quickly as possible, really. I, I don't think that would have been the right thing to do at all, to be honest. There's only one operation that was to remove the pituitary tumour. And, and deal with his abdominal sepsis at the same time. I, mean, no, I, think, also, I, I think if we'd left this two or three days, he would have died. Yeah. I think that's true. We were all very worried about him at that time, and thank you for operating as quickly as you did. I think it's worth saying that with very high ACTH levels, adrenalectomy can be very difficult in a Cushing's patient to absolutely clear all of it, because we've certainly had some where you cannot get all of the adrenal out, and so they have persistent Cushing's even, and then of course the ACTH drives further growth. Uh, so, so if we can target the source, that is the best option. It depends who's available, of course. If you have neurosurgery on site, then that is clearly where you want to go. And if you only have um, adrenal surgeons, then we have no other choice. I guess that might be the point that's being made. Thank you. So listen, we're going to move on to the next case now, actually. Um, thank you so much, Jocelyn, for that. That was tremendous. And we're on to our next case now, just making sure we're sticking to time. And this is a case from King's College Hospital. Thank you very much for contributing this. And I'm going to ask um, Adrian Lee to talk to us um, about this interesting case. If you want to share your slides, please. Thank you, sure. Adrian. Thanks. Can you hear me OK? Perfectly. Thank you. Okay, so um, thank you very much for this opportunity to present our case of a giant functioning pituitary ad gonadotroph adenoma, which required a three-stage surgical approach. So our case begins with a 34-year-old gentleman uh, who had a generalized tonic-clonic seizure one night, and the incident which woke his wife uh, led to an LAS call-out, and he was taken to A&E, where he rapidly progressed to status epilepticus, requiring intubation and ventilation. He underwent a CT head scan, and here we can see that there is a, a, a pituitary cellar lesion, and which is also present in the ventricle as well. We managed to obtain a collateral history. So this is a gentleman who had been uh, well, except for a headache on the day of presentation requiring simple analgesia, which itself was slightly unusual for him because he had no other past medical history. He did not usually have headaches. He was not on regular medications and there was no relevant family history. He was unemployed, uh, he was a non-smoker, but he did uh, frequent the gym quite a lot. On examination, he had increased testicular volume. He had a right-sided hemiparesis, but he had relatively normal muscle bulk, no acne and normal body hair distribution. We were unable to assess visual fields preoperatively because he was intubated and ventilated, but fundoscopy did reveal uh, bilateral papilledema. This is his biochemistry, which I'll just run through. He had a markedly elevated prolactin, although no symptoms of hyperprolactinemia. He had an elevated cortisol, but had been administered with intravenous hydrocortisone on presentation. He had a mild hypothyroxinemia with a normal IGF-1. But whereas in hyperprolactinemia, we often expect gonadotropins to be partially or fully suppressed, here we had markedly elevated gonadotropins with an FSH, nearly 10 times the upper limit of normal, an elevated LH and an undetectably high testosterone level. 
So this is a pituitary MRI, which shows a very large cellar mass and significant supra ex supracellar extension. It's growing anteriorly um, as well as into the ventricle and there is heterogeneous signal intensity. The lesion also descends uh, through the pituitary fossa into the sphenoid sinus. This is the uh, coronal uh, view that we see here. And additionally, we see that the uh, lesion invaginates into the left frontal temporal lobe and splays the optic chiasm. There is also significant hypertrophy of the temporalis muscles bilaterally. Now, the initial medical approach was uh, complicated by the fact that the patient had a rhabdomyolysis with a peak creatinine kinase of over 45,000, and this led to a significant acute kidney injury. He also failed the initial sedation wean and had an elevated troponin uh, with associated ST segment changes on uh, ECG. He required careful medical stabilization in an intensive care setting and needed both uh, brief renal replacement therapy and cardiology input, where we managed the uh, myocardial infarction conservatively. He was initiated on intravenous hydrocortisone, but antiplatelets were not able to be initiated in light of uh, the impending neurosurgery that was about to happen. So the surgical approach was a very complex one. And actually the neurosurgeons here essentially held their own local MDT to decide how to best tackle this tumour because there were multiple uh, possible strategies here. In the end, they opted for the first stage here, which was a transphenoidal debulking of the cellar and infracellar components of the pituitary adenoma. Now, the reason for this was to uh, firstly obtain some histology, but also to assess the consistency of the tumour. Now, um, pituitary adenomas are usually soft, and if the consistency is favourable, this uh, procedure and approach can actually allow for significant debulking of the tumour initially, and in some cases can reduce the need for craniotomy, although in this case, because of the sheer size of the tumour, it was uh, pretty much anticipated that the patient would need to uh, move on to a craniot craniotomy. Uh, also, the patient was still medically unstable, and this approach is a familiar and relatively uh, quick procedure. And lastly, the patient presented with status epilepticus, which usually leads to subsequent uh, significant uh, edema. And therefore, craniotomy is preferably avoided uh, to reduce the risk of intraoperative cerebral edema. This is just a, a diagram to show uh, the, the approach that was made. And um, this is a before and after the first stage of surgery, which shows that uh, significant um, tumor has been resected and that the tumor has really dropped down there. The second approach uh, was a transcortical transventricular debulking of the intraventricular component. Okay. And this is again, the coronal view, which kind of makes it obvious why that was a, a, a sensible approach. And part of this uh, procedure was also to open up the CSF pathways. Okay. And this is again before and after photographs, which shows that the um, intraventricular component has been well resected. So there was a fortnight gap between the first and the second stage, and then there was another 14 days between the second and the third stage. By this point, the patient uh, underwent a perional craniotomy. Okay. And this is just a video um, showing part of the neurosurgery. Okay. And the patient had become more medically stabilized. Um, and whereas before he was still relatively medically unstable and therefore that restricted his uh, operating table time. Uh, here he was better, um, there we can see the optic chiasm, and also there was still residual tumour uh, and visual compromise, which is why we opted to proceed with the third stage. 
The post-operative phase uh, was further complicated by the patient contracting COVID-19 infection and developing a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, which may have been associated with the COVID-19 infection. However, he did not require re-escalation to intensive care for respiratory support. He did need extensive neurorehabilitation as an inpatient, and he had fluctuations in, uh, in visual acuity through serial visual field assessments. However, the visual acuity was responsive to Rickham reservoir tapping. The histology again reconfirmed the diagnosis by showing focal LH and FSH positivity with a KI67 index of 1 to 2 percent. He was replaced with hydrocortisone and levothyroxine and his functional status has since significantly improved. He does have ongoing community physiotherapy but is now able to mobilize independently around the house and also outside the house. His most recent uh, visual assessment shows that he has uh, hand movements um, in the left side, but his right uh, visual acuity is at 6 over 12. However, it was agreed with the ophthalmology team that had no surgical intervention been conducted, he would most likely have lost complete vision in both eyes. And here the gonadotropins um, can be utilised as a tumour marker in this case. And this leads to the latest biochemistry, which shows that the gonadotropins, whereas the FSH before was 108, has now normalised as has the testosterone. Um, he is not on any testosterone replacement. His glucagon stimulation test does demonstrate growth hormone and cortisol insufficiency. I have some before and after images um, from before the operation, the first operation and, and post his third stage. And we can see that there is complete resection of the cellar and supracellar tumor. And again, the coronal images show likewise demonstrating a good resection of the tumour and um, there is a large subgalial collection there over the left parietotemporal bone. Functioning gonadotroph adenomas are rare tumours and this case series from 2016 which looked at a 17 year period identified only seven cases which five were male. The presentations of these included visual field deficits, headache and sexual dysfunction. To summarise, we're presenting here a case of a 34-year-old gentleman with a functioning gonadotroph adenoma. His presentation of status was likely due to cortical irritation by the tumour and the right-sided hemiparesis due to Todd's phenomenon post-ictally. The hyperprolactinemia was likely due to a stalk effect and the patient underwent a very complicated three-stage surgical approach but has had a very positive outcome. Most gonadotroph adenomas are non-functioning and non-functioning adenomas are classically larger. However, in this case, we had a patient with a gonadotroph adenoma that was both functioning and particularly large. The discussion points for the audience, we wondered uh, whether the audience felt that the supraphysiological testosterone levels may have contributed to this patient's myocardial infarction. And secondly, with the Mentimeter, um, whether the audience would use radiotherapy upfront in this case, or just monitor biochemically and uh, radiologically only. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Adrian. That was so interesting. Uh, Corinne, before we go on to Mentimeter, there are some questions in the chat. Um, and there's obviously the first question from Adrian around the supraphysiological testosterone levels. We might just spend a couple of minutes just talking about that. There's so, a comment um, from uh, Harriet as well about that. But the hematocrit. Yes, yeah, so I think in, in um, Adrian's um, abstract, you say that the patient was not polycythemic. Is that correct, Adrian? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah. So then the other question a couple of people have asked. So you mentioned at the beginning that he was very fond of the gym, which I think lots of endocrinologists ears pricked up with that. Um, and then, interestingly, you give us a patient with supraphysiological testosterone, but also, as someone's also rightly commented, unsuppressed gonadotrophins, which wouldn't support exogenous testosterone replacement. But do you think the supraphysiological testosterone made him go to the gym more often in terms of was he suddenly like some sort of superhero in terms of being able to go to the gym so regularly? I mean, he's got a testosterone which is double the upper limit of the reference range, isn't it? So I wondered if he reported going to the gym more, actually, if anything. So I understand that the wife did mention he was going to the gym a lot. Um, but did reassure us that he wasn't taking any anabolic steroids. I know that we also do have um, uh, Miss Maritos, who uh, was the neurosurgeon 
who performed the neurosurgery. Um, I think her hand was up, but she might just put it down. Yes, her hand is up. So please do do um, ask us what you wanted to. Elena, I think it is. I think she might be muted. Oh, oh maybe not. Can you hear me now? Yes, oh, we yes, can hear, we can you. hear you. Thank you. Fantastic. So, yes, um, I just wanted to say that, yes, he was indeed very keen on the gym and his, uh, his keenness had increased over the last, over the sort of two years prior to admission. Um, I can only think it must have been the high testosterone. And, and I did wonder whether this is why we don't really see very many functioning gonadotroph tumours in men, as they don't seem to complain about their high testosterone levels. Yes, it's very interesting. And his testicular volume was high as well, wasn't it? So, um, and look, it's a, it's a terrible outcome for a 34-year-old. I mean, you've done so well in terms of site preservation, um, as you've mentioned, but, you know, for him to have been going to the gym independently and well and, and now sort of having community rehabilitation, it just goes to show actually how, you know, you can have this sort of latent tumour until it sort of has presented very dramatically in this patient. Um, I mean, I think um, to be fair to him, there were a number of factors that um, we didn't have time to touch upon when we were preparing the presentation, but um, it turned out during his admission that he didn't really have recourse to public funds in this country. So that may have contributed to any delay in diagnosis. It was unclear whether he had any visual deterioration on the lead up um, and whether he had neglected that because he wasn't able to seek medical um, attention until he, it became an emergency. And in fact, he was, he was pretty well when he was discharged. I mean, the community physiotherapy was ongoing um, up to a point where he wasn't able to access any community physiotherapy. So he had a lot of physiotherapy as an inpatient, but he was independently mobilizing intact power, all four limbs. He had a visual acuity problem in the left eye, but apart from that, he was pretty much as he was when he came in. Um, so he, he, he's done really remarkably well. Yes, thank you. He really has done remarkably well, actually. And yes, very sobering, but actually some of the late presentation may be to do with limitation to access of, of, of NHS um, help, really. Um, so I guess uh, the question, which I think probably ties in with a couple of questions on the chat, and maybe one that we might vote on Mentimeter now, is we've obviously seen this very, very large tumour, a very... Um, very dramatic presentation in this patient and a, and a difficult post-operative um, course and has now been discharged and as Adrian's rightly said we've got FSH and LH as our markers presumably in terms of tumour markers so at this point what would we like to do as an audience would we like to monitor him with periodic uh, MRI imaging um, and just wait and see or would we like to um, get in there and use some radiotherapy so it might just be worth um, voting for a second and seeing the outcome for that. So if we can all just do our centimetre vote, would we like to refer for radiotherapy now in terms of the size of the tumour at presentation? Uh, yes, it's a very good point. <laughs> um, there was a hand up. There was a hand up just now from Nigel, I think. OK, sorry. It's a very good point from Alison. About, sorry. This question to Eleni, if she's still there, was I mean, it's a fantastic surgical result. It's a sort of tumour that's... Pitrochi surgeons really want to treat. As the question for Ellie, which was, was, was she tempted to consider a, uh, a, a, an operation going from below and above at the same time? Because yeah. you, I think you could have predicted that the endoscopic approach, unless you were really lucky, you really wasn't going to debulk the tumour. Yeah, I, I totally agree. We had lots of discussions with, um, you know, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Barazzi and I, yeah. the three of us, we, we got together. And as you know, we often operate as pairs. Um, we discussed all the different approaches um, and he just really wasn't stable enough for a craniotomy at the beginning. Um, so we wanted to get tissue. We wanted to confirm it was an adenoma, um, see what how aggressive it was. Was it something unusual? And just yeah. try and debulk as much as possible. You see how it descended? Yeah, and yeah. We thought that might tailor our craniotomy then to a smaller tumour. Um, sure just that was our thinking really but yeah absolutely the other option would have been just to go straight from the top and just do an hemispheric and and decompress the chiasm that way and leave a residual in the cellar you know yeah. or, or not you know there were so many different ways to approach it but this was just how 
we tailored this one. I, th I think you, you, your approach is exactly what we would have done as well for what it's worth. I don't Excellent. think we've done anything differently. But well, I'm sure, in fact, we wouldn't have done. Thank you. No, thank you. That's a, it was a really wonderful case. And as Nigel says, a great surgical outcome. So, so well done. So um, we're just going to have a look at the results of this Mentimeter for a minute. Um, Alison Renz made a very good point. It's just worth reminding ourselves that certain, if patients have um, limited access to, to NHS funding, uh, they're allowed to have um, input as an emergency. And clearly he presented with um, a tonic-clonic seizure and came in through casualty. So I, I, I'm not, I'm not have to say that the expert on funding, but my understanding is it's called, it, under the acute setting, that's all allowed. But um, Alison has a good point that actually radiotherapy and mon monitoring becomes more complicated, probably NHS wise, because that's not considered an emergency treatment. Um, Elin, you um, want to respond, I think. Yes. Um, so that was also partly why I wanted to obtain a, a complete surgical resection for him. Um, and I didn't want, in other cases, we quite often cytoreduct tumours and monitor the residual and offer radiotherapy for recurrence, but he wasn't going to be able to access that treatment. So I wanted to obtain a complete surgical resection so that even if he didn't have any further treatment, he may get away with it. That's really helpful. Thank you. So gosh, so much complexity to this case, actually. So just in terms of where we are, <clears throat> The majority, so two thirds want to do monitoring and, and a third want to do radiotherapy. Um, I can see the um, appeal of radiotherapy in that I guess he's lost a couple of axes and um, it, it was a large tumour. But as we've heard, we may not be able to have the patient, uh, I mean, the patient might not be able to access that from an NHS point of view. And certainly that was part of the consideration uh, during neurosurgery. So, so Gosh, lots to consider. Karuba, I think the KI six, yeah, the, the KI sixty seven index of one to two percent was also quite reassuring as well, in some ways. Yes, I mean, although they're funny, aren't they, KI sixty seven indices, because they can look really bland, uh, but actually you can have quite an aggressive tumour, which I think is a point that we make at various pituitary uh, meetings around the country every year, isn't it? That I suppose you can have some reassurance, but. Sometimes mm -hmm. the patients, the, the, the tumours can behave very aggressively, nevertheless. I don't think, Karim, I can see any more hands. Is I, think, I think it is interesting that it's making both LH and FSH, um, because yes. some of them make one or the other, so that's quite interesting. Okay, so listen, thank you so much for that case for King's, and thank you for, for the neurosurgical input from King's as well. That was really interesting to listen to the decision-making around that. We're going to move on to our, our final case before break. Um, and this is also um, about a, a gonadotroph adenoma. And this is Dr. Papinikalou, uh, who is from the Reproductive Endocrinology uh, Unit at Imperial. So uh, Nicoletta, if you can share your screen and you can start, that will be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin. And I think our case is well, very well after Adrian's case. Can you see? Yes, perfectly, thank you. Off you go. So um, today with my colleague Martin, we present not one but two very interesting cases on adenomas. So I'll start with case one. So I present the case of a 37-year-old woman who is originally from Germany, but has been in the for the last 10 to 15 years. Apart from PCOS, she's otherwise speaking well. She used to be on the oral contraceptive field for a few years. However, following this, the polymyscontination, she um, had amenorrhea for 10 months and then the rate became irregular. She was not on any medications, nothing regular, nothing over the counter, and she had no allergies. So one day she presented to local AME with pelvic pain and bloating. The pain was intermittent, coming up to five episodes a day and lasting a couple of hours. Pain was moderate to severe, requiring her to take some over the counter analgesia. So, when, when she was in on AE, she was clearly in discomfort. And apart from a generalized lower abdomen with voluntary guarding, the systemic examination was otherwise unremarkable. 
So she had her recent investigations on Amy, including full blood count, disease release, biochemistry profile, CRP, everything was fine. Lactate dog was raised at 3.2, and a pregnancy test was negative. So that prompted to have a CT scan, which shows suspicious mixer, and therefore she was referred to the gynae team in the local hospital. But the following day, she had an ultrasound, and that's a general ultrasound. This is an actual photo from the right ovary. As you can see, the ovaries are very large, with multi cysts. cyst. Nicoletta, could you put the um, speaker volume down? We, we can't hear the audio very clearly. Yes, give me a quick second. It's kind of better now. So she was then referred to a tertiary to a to an very tertiary clinic which they did at the hormonal profile. So I'd like to draw your attention on the um, estrogen levels. Look how high they were, 7,000 picomoles. The rest of the hormonal screen showed FSH and age with the normal limit. Same for TSH and cortisol. For lactin, might be raised at 1800 and 34 and IGF-1, just below the reference range. However, when the case was discussed with the endocrinologist as well, they noted that the FSH was, uh, was, was non-suppressed as we would expect with that level of struggle. So she was diagnosed with ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, but what was causing this? So the fact that she has um, signs of um, hypo, uh, signs of hypogonadism and the fact that the FSH was non suppressed, as expected by the very high estrogen, she had an MRI scan, which confirmed a very big pituitary macrogonoma. Look at the size 40, four centimeters, with bilateral cabinosinus involvement, compressing the optic hyacinth, and also um, causing impingement on the left optic nerve just before the hyacinth. So that's your visual phase. I can appreciate it. You know the classic bicameral hemianopia. However, she had a nasal inferior uh, defect on the left side, which is um, secondary to the uh, impingement of the left optic nerve. So in summary, we have a 37-year-old lady with spontaneous ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome with a probably going to be problem with the adenoma. The case was discussing the pituitary MDP and the outcome was to proceed with trastuminoidal surgery plus or minus radiotherapy. So once she was waiting for her surgery, she was uh, continuously seen in the endocrinology clinic and she started on some glandriotide treatment. She was actually uh, managed to have two doses, but that showed no difference in hormonal profile. She then ended up having her transfer surgery, which confirmed our suspicion that it was about a gonadotropic inferior adenoma with 20% of the cells expressing a late and 30% expressing FSH. The guy 67 marker was between 3 to 4%. Now, she had a second MRI done, and that was on day one post surgery, which showed that there was still some residual tissue, mainly in the left cavernal sinus, but the optic was decompressed. And this is a nice table there that summarizes how your hormones behave from day two to six weeks post surgery. As you can see, the gonadotropins were suppressed low immediately following surgery, and they start recovering when the estrogen levels, the, late, the latest measurement of six weeks was undetected. The rest of the hormones were fine. Don't be alarmed with the cortisol, 41, so just on steroids. And at this stage, I'm going to ask Magic to take over for me and, and discuss the second case. Thank you. So we have our second case, which represents the mind and of the clinical spectrum of FSH producing um, pituitary adenoma. We have a 68-year-old man with a background of type 2 diabetes and hyperlipidemia, presented to the neurology clinic with skills of unsteadiness and dizziness and he was investigated 
systemic examination was normal and he was investigated with the brain MRI. And the brain MRI showed a large cellular mass. Now, this pituitary region was having a supracellular component, an infracellular component, and a paracellular component. If you notice here, the supracellular component, which was having a, a cystic and heterogeneous appearance, and it was pushing the optic chiasm and stretching it superior. Now, the patient was referred to the endocrine clinic for further assistance. An investigation done at the endocrine clinic showed a particular profile with FSH, elevated FSH of 94.9, with LH of 9.8. The testosterone at that time was 30.5 elevated, and the hematocrit was 0.44, and there is no polycythemia. The patient had a normal libido, a normal erections, a normal testicular volume by examination. He had a normal hair growth and secondary sexual practice with no acne. And surprisingly, the visual team did not show a significant defect that one would expect with such large pituitary macroidenoma. So the case was discussed at the pituitary MDP, and the decision was like to review the patient annually with a surveillance scan and biochemical assessment and clinical assessment. So over the past six years, the patient made clinically stable. And this is the most recent MRI, you can see on the top here, which showed the stable appearance of the large pituitary macroadenoma. And if you can see here, the first graph on the top, where to present the FSH level over the years, you can see that the FSH level remained innovative. Now, most interesting, if you have a look at the testosterone level as well, you can see that there is a gradual decline of the testosterone level. However, it remains within the normal range. If you can see here a snapshot of the results um, in this table here, we have the testosterone level from 2015 at the level of 30.5, just above the normal limit. And most recently, the testosterone came back at 13.7. Now, the inhibiting level, it was 176 in 2015. Most recently, it was low at 23. So there was a question. So this reduction of inhibiting B, is it a sign of vesicular failure? So this, these are some quick points about gonadotropsal adenoma. The most common histological subtype of the pituitary adenoma, and they are 15 to 40 percent of all pituitary adenoma, and they have 80 percent of non functional pituitary adenoma. And the majority of the immunohistochemically confirmed gonadotrop adenoma are hormonally silent or non clinically functioning. And the clinically functioning FSHOMAs are rare and based on the case reports and small series. So, how do they present? Um, they can present a mass effect. Because the majority of them are macroadenomas. Specifically in women, they can cause mandatory irregularities, infertility, galactoria, or very high stimulation syndrome, as in the first case, while the many can present with particular enlargement or possibly hypogonadism. The mainstay of treatment remains surgical excision of the tumor. There's been documented some trials of medical therapy, however, the results are scant. So this is the end of our presentation. So we have set a couple of questions just for open discussion. So regarding the first case, she's coming back to clinic, she wants a baby. What can we do if your periods do not start? And for the second case, the FSH now is increasing. Should we do anything about it? Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. That was so interesting. Two uh, very different examples of function and gonadotroph. Tumors. Um, I suppose the sensible thing to do, just looking at the questions in the chat too, before I just quickly look at the hands, is maybe to ask um, Dr. Jay Athena. So Chana um, is the last author on this case, and someone had asked already in the in the chat, Chana, around fertility plans and around this low estradiol um, post um, surgery in this patient. And I wondered if you could talk us through her post-op investigations and what her options are from a fertility point of view, if you wouldn't mind. Yes, of course, thank you. Thanks, Jenna. Uh, so the problem with um, 
with, 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 a, with a female, with a woman presenting with an adrenopadenoma, is that when you have autonomous FSH secretion, you're going to you're going to be amenorrheic, and because you already have FSH on board, you can't then super stimulate them. You can't give them out IVF and induce ovulation. So the ideal outcome, as was said in the chat, would actually be for her to miraculously become normal, normogonadal, and start having regular periods. And we're going to wait till month three post-op to see if that's happened. But if that hasn't, the, the next best thing is that she becomes hypogonadal. And if she does indeed have an estradiol that's undetectable, then that's okay. We can work with that and give her ovulation induction. To, but, but, the, but the thing we can't work with is, is her still being hypergonadal and amenorrheic because then the, the, the reproductive medicine colleagues will not be able to do anything about it and she'll need secondary treatment. And Chana, just looking at, at the chat, is there anything to what, so say you've got your scenario as a low estradiol, have FSH and LH have stayed low post-operatively and you want to do ovulation induction. Um, presumably, because you're talking about exogenous gonadotrophins, there's not any concern around that that will make any change to the tumour itself, for example, or any residual tissue. Well, that's the belief, isn't it? And uh, that, that, that's what we hope. And it, and it will be for a relatively short period of time. And of course, it's important for the patient, isn't it? Um, for, 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 you know, it's one of the major things she wants in terms of her, her management and for quality of life. So I don't think there's anything in the, in the limited literature to suggest that there'll be any danger to that. It's been done, it's been done multiple times in the past. Thank you, Chana. And just sticking with the, in terms of we would, we were shown that she's got cavernous, bilateral cavernous sinus invasion um, on her imaging <coughs> preoperatively, uh, which obviously then makes total surgical remission impossible, really. Um, have you got any thoughts? I, I mean, I was in the MDTs when we talked about her. What are the concerns around the, the sort of immediate term normalization of her FSH and LH, or are you just going to monitor that? I think we're going to have to monitor it. And, you know, there have only been 50 case, cases of this described in the, in the literature. So we don't really have a, a you know, a normative uh, post-operative, um, I guess, um, you know, evolution to, 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 to hope she follows. Um, I think if, you know, it's likely that at some point in the future she's going to need she's going to need secondary, you know, treatment to that. Our hope is that this primary treatment would have allowed her to to have fertility treatment, so for her to be normal or hypogonadal. Otherwise, I mean, she's thirty eight, so you know, there's a danger that we're going to miss her fertility window for stimulation. Someone asked about the imaging, so this is her post op imaging. Mm. And then it's, it's a good clearance compared to the pre-op. No, it is. It is indeed, and um, yeah, I'll be interested to know what everyone thinks about. Let's say, let's say she remains anovulatory. Um, what what do we do then? I mean, presumably radiotherapy would take a very long time to to work. Yes, and also I think it's probably worth saying for the trainees that I don't know that we, um, I don't think there's much evidence based, Chana. I'm just thinking about our MDT discussion and decision about trying lamnitide in case any of the trainees or any of the audience actually wondering about that. I think we were simply trying to manage a difficult situation in terms of giving her anything that we could try and anything to try and control the FSH and LH, well the FSH particularly preoperatively because of her enlarged ovaries, that was the rationale wasn't it? It was, it, it was and sadly we don't have any any efficacy data in the literature because there's such little, but yes it was it was it was merely um, empirical absolutely. Um, the second question just to ask, I can't see any questions in the meantime as it popped up in the chat, was around that second case, very interesting that <clears throat> Majid showed uh, a high FSH, but with time, the testosterone had fallen and you showed us some inhibin levels to, to sort of demonstrate that your hypothesis was testicular failure. And it made me wonder if it was a bit like beta cell oh, failure, that if your beta cells are pushed for such a long period of time, do they, you know, it, it, we think that they eventually give up or exhaust. And I wondered if, if you sort of thought this was synonymous with if you have your... <clears throat> 
if you have your gonads pushed by FSH for a really long period of time in a man? Is, have we got sort of testicular exhaustion, if that makes sense? Is that what you were thinking? Um, we weren't thinking that. I'm not sure. I, I, I don't knowingly know of, of, of that being described as a phenomenon. We were actually more mundanely thinking that he's now in his sort of 60s and he's, you know, you will get from the age of 40 a 1% drop in testicular function if his, uh, you know, if his metabolism as well, if his BMI is increased, then there may be sort of secondary and partial testicular failure. But you're right. It, it, we can't exclude that, you know, his, his lady cells would have been knackered um, to, to put a finer point on it. Yeah. I'm sure there must be an, a, a referral out there for one of us that is a referral with a testicular exhaustion, a bit like a, a, adrenal fatigue. It must be coming our way soon. Uh, James, you've got your hand up. I just wondered if we might give some thought to the possibility that the gonadotrophin measurements reflect immunoactivity in vitro, but not necessarily bioactivity in vivo. We know that both gonadotrophins are extensively have go through post-translational modification and glycosylation. And the assumption that your FSH of 100 is 10 times more powerful than your FSH of 10, which is 10 times more powerful than your FSH of 1, is probably not the case. So if it were the case that this tumor is changing mm. and glycosylation and post-translational processing is, is getting less normal, you'd expect testicular failure or some reduced testicular drive to follow from that. I say that because I think it may well be the case that many silent gonadotroph adenomas fail because although they stain for FSH and LH according to neuropathology, they don't glycosylate and function properly. So there's a whole area there of bioactivity as opposed to immunoactivity that might be relevant in this case as well, I wonder. Yes, that's very interesting, Shannon. Do you want to take that? Yeah, I actually think that's a brilliant point. I hadn't thought about that. And I think um, that that could be a, an alternate explanation for this as well. Very I mean, I suppose in that first case, Chana, the fact that the patient had ovarian hyperstimulation we and such high estradiol levels, we have to have functionality of that, of that FSH and LH. But I guess in your second case, unlike our previous case from King's, we had a patient with normal testicular volume, didn't we? So it was a slightly different scenario. So yes, thank you, James. I'm just conscious that um, everyone needs to, well, not everyone, but people may want to nip to the loo or to grab a cup of tea in the next 10 minutes. So I'm going to be very strict about finishing now and coming back in, in 10 minutes, so at 3.30. Just before I let you go, I'm going to ask Karim to share a slide with you about a very important um, petition that he has started um, that I'm sure all of you have um, completed, but just to try and make a plea about um, Karim's petition about drug pricing. Um, and if you've got a minute between now and when we join again at 15.30, uh, uh, if you can vote about that, that would be fantastic. So I'm going to just see you back here in 10 minutes, uh, time for a comfort break or a tea break. All right, see you in 10 minutes. So we're going to start uh, with Dr. McFarlane from Cambridge, who's going to speak to us um, about uh, a microprolactinoma um, and a surgical um, option. So Dr. McFarlane, if you can share your slides, please. Thank you. Fantastic, right. So thank you very much to the organizers for the opportunity uh, to present this interesting case uh, entitled Dopamine Agonist Intolerance in an Occult Microprolactinoma, Successful Selective Adenomectomy Facilitated by 11 c methionine pet mri so the case is of a 37-year-old woman who was referred to uh, secondary care um, with secondary amenorrhea by her GP. So she stopped a combined oral contraceptive pill with a view to conceiving, um, but unfortunately um, she subsequently had a lack of any periods. And she also reported several months of intermittent galactaria as well. So this very competent GP had dutifully measured several and on more than one occasion the prolactin was elevated more than twice. Um, relevant to the background as well as the patient was known to have osteopenia and she was on some vitamin d replacement and on the right hand side here i've just shown some of our initial um, workup in terms of the usual confounders for um uh an elevated prolactin so we did a cannulated prolactin measurement this was uh, showed that Prolactin was still elevated, so excluding just the stress of phlebotomy. 
She was not pregnant. She did not have significant renal or liver impairment. She was euthyroid. Uh, there were no other interfering medications. Exercise was not a significant issue and um, other laboratory causes of a um, spuriously elevated prolactin were excluded as well. So at this point, we were reasonably confident we were dealing with a prolactinoma and we proceeded to some imaging. So I've got that on this slide here. So these are T1 spin echo MRIs. I've got a sagittal image on the left and a coronal on the right. And immediately from looking at the corona, you can see this is not a symmetrical gland and there's some heterogeneity here. Uh, and I'm taking a, a sagittal slice here within the right side of the gland. And there's a, a couple of potential areas of, of suspicion. So there's this hypo intensity within the mid gland here, a couple of millimeters. Could that be a small cystic microadenoma? Could it be a Rathke's cleft cyst? And I would also suggest if you look at the anterior part of the gland, it doesn't enhance uniformly like the rest of the gland. Could this also be uh, a microprolactinoma? So we've got our imaging in our biochemistry. We're, we're confident at this point we think it's a microprolactinoma, although we're not entirely sure where within the gland this is located. So we proceed with usual first line medical therapy with dopamine agonists for this patient. However, this was very challenging for the patient and she suffered from a number of side effects. So nasal stuffiness, nausea, headaches, and more concerningly, mood changes, so low mood. And you can see here the highest doses of the different preparations that she managed to tolerate. Half a tablet twice a week of cabergolin. You know, these are, these are starter doses of these medications. We would expect probably only a minority of patients to be completely um, euplactinemic on these, but unfortunately she wasn't able to, to tolerate up titration such that we could achieve a normal prolactin. And the lowest prolactin we achieved over a period of many years was 1200, so more than twice the upper limit of normal. So when you failed medical therapy, this is usually when we may consider other options such as surgical intervention. However, based on the imaging available, and I'll go and show you some more imaging, this is equivocal. We do not have a clear um, lesion to selectively remove. Um, and at this point, the patient was also a little bit reluctant to um, consider neurosurgical intervention and wanted to, to persevere with more medical therapy with the hope of uh, achieving spontaneous fertility. From the endocrine side, while she was hyperfractinemic, we were continuing to, to monitor her bones with serial DEXA scans, and there was no significant deterioration. So this is another imaging slide. Again, these are more... Um, T1 spin echo MRIs after she's had a little bit of medical therapy. And you can see that these look a little bit different to the previous MR. Um, the stalk remains in the midline. So this is pre-contrast on the left, post on the right. But now I would suggest to you um, that this area on the right looks a little bit more suspicious. It appears fuller on the pre-contrast imaging as well. It appears a little bit hypo-intense. And again, I've taken a couple of select sagittal slices out. So within the right side of the gland here, Again, it looks convex in its contour, and there's this small hypo-intensity in that same infero midline area, but also the sagittal section on the left looks suspicious. So at this point, the patient remains hyperprolactinemic on the highest dose of cabergolin she can titrate. It's not in, there are multiple areas of suspicion. So what can we do? Well, we've got some choices we could carry on, with dopamine agonist therapy, it's not been successful up until this point, but we could continue trying to titrate her cabergolin. We could do away with that entirely. We could replace her estrogen with HRT, and she could consider um, fertility via IVF or other mechanisms. Or we could think about transplanoidal surgery. But if we've not got a clear lesion, we'd have to explore the whole gland. Or I would putatively suggest a fourth option where we could employ molecular imaging in the attempt to localize a, a microprolactinoma prior to consideration of surgery. And that's exactly what we went on to do. So on the left here is the MRI and on the right is the uh, methionine PET overlaid on the CT. And you can see here this clear area of focal tracer avidity within the left side of the gland, suggesting that this area on the left actually, rather than the previously suspicious area on the right, is most likely to be a secretory microprolactinoma. And we can analyze the PET in more sophisticated ways as well. So these again are the pre and post contrast T1 coronal MRIs. Again, it's very difficult to call on this where the prolactinoma may sit. There's an area of heterogeneity and reducing intensity on the right as well as the left. 
This is the volumetric MRI with the um, PET overlaying onto it. You can see a clear focus here on the left with an anatomical corridor. Um, we were also able to do these very nice 3D reconstructions where we combine the CT, the MR and the PET um, to produce a model. And so in red here are the uh, intracavernous uh, carotid arteries. The blue is what we suspect to be the normal gland. And the yellow is the adenoma here, just nuzzling the left side of the um, intracavernous carotid on the left. We went on, so with the additional imaging modality, we were able to proceed to surgery with greater confidence. The, the patient was then happy to do so. Um, and at the operation, uh, our neurosurgical team encountered a, a necrotic tumor in the left cell where it was predicted to be by the PET. Um, histopathologically, you can see the HE here. This was a pituitary adenoma and it stained strongly for prolactin on the immunohistochemistry. And she's had a very good outcome in this patient. She had spontaneous restoration of her menses and she remained normal prolactinemic for the following four years of follow up. So, very briefly, um, thinking about surgery for microprolactinomas, dopamine agonists remain the first line therapy, but they can cause a wide range of side effects. Um, and I think in recent years, it would be fair to say we've been paying more attention to the neuropsychiatric side effects with um, authors recognizing um, an increasing proportion of patients being treated for prolactinomas on dopamine agonists are suffering from impulse control disorders. This paper is suggesting up to one in six patients. And due to these side effects, often we're unable to titrate the doses high enough to get a full treatment response. Um, so increasingly, there's a paradigm shift in some centres where we're thinking about transphenoidal surgery earlier. Um, and there's some good literature to support this. So from the Leiden group, they've in 2020 done a very nice meta-analysis that's shown that for patients with microplactinomas, after we withdraw gaberglin or other dopamine agonists, only 36% patients will remain in remission, whereas after surgery, this is up to 83%. And they've also shown that transphenoidal surgery in this context is reasonably safe as well, with you know, a 2% risk of patients having permanent DI and 3% risk of CSF leaks in their meta-analysis. So on top of that, we would also propose that when appearances on the conventional MRI are equivocal, methionine PET can augment that imaging and help to accurately localize where a microprolactinoma may lie within the gland. This can enable the clinical team and the patient to more accurately balance the potential benefits of surgery against the potential risks. And it may also mitigate the need to explore the whole gland. If we can give the surgeons a little bit of a heads up before the procedure, we expect it's here. They may be able to go directly to that location and potentially minimize the risk of any complications. This is a series of 10 patients in whom we've done this for locally. So 10 patients with microplactinomas that are challenging or difficult to see on MRI alone. And five of them have proceeded to transphenoidal surgery and um, remain in remission. One of them's had stereotactic radio surgery and seen a significant improvement in their practin levels. One patient is still awaiting surgery um, and three more have um, decided they would not like to pursue surgery and are gonna continue on medical therapy. So that's all that I would like to say. Just want to quickly thank our group and all of our collaborators. Particularly like to thank Wal Bashari for helping me prepare this presentation and Prof Ganel for his ongoing supervision. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, James. That was so interesting, really clear presentation. Um, gosh, lots to talk about. Um, I suppose I'm just gonna kick off and, and let people uh, talk in, in the chat or, or put their hands up. Um, as you've rightly said, um, we're becoming much more um, focused on uh, side effects in terms of psychiatric side effects, etc. Um, I just wondered, had she actually conceived in terms of, I, I, that was the original want, wasn't it? Has she conceived since or? It was the original one. And yeah, she has sadly has not conceived, unfortunately, this lady. So biochemically, she was normal prolactinemic, but she hasn't conceived. Okay, okay, thank you. Well, I don't know if anyone else um, wants to um, ask anything of, of James. Certainly, I think that you put in your presentation an interesting uh, review in terms of surgery for um, prolactinomas. And I think the sort of traditional medical mantra is that we treat medically and surgery is very, you know, very sort of rarely used. But I think all of us have had cases where patients have been intolerant 
um, as I say, we're very, very conscious of psychiatric side effects, more mindful of them now, I think, are more likely to go to surgery. I don't know if I can see Nigel is here, and I wondered if Nigel Mendoza wanted to say anything from the sur neurosurgical point of view, because I think, Nigel, you've been involved with a few from us, haven't you, in terms of uh, patients who have been intolerant of dopamine agonists? Um, uh, Nigel is not here, it's just me, uh, Neil. Oh, uh, sorry, I saw Nigel's name, I, I do apologise. Uh, oh, he logged on to my computer. Anyway, I think in terms of uh, prolactinomas, I think they do become a surgical candidate whenever there is a medical concern in terms of intolerant uh, medication or side effect from the medication, and also uh, lack of response to um, medication. And most often they are uh, ideal target because they are within reasonable size. And, um, and also uh, in terms of the size and their uh, extent, they, they seem to be good surgical targets. There's no concern, but concern comes when you have a diffuse target as um, James showed, uh, which uh, will de uh, got demarcated after the uh, methionine scan, which we have done in many other functional tumors that you know. So I think from a surgical perspective, they seem to be good target whenever there is a concern surgically and medically. Um, and thank you, Ramesh. And sticking with that, um, and maybe Mark Gunnell can come in too, who's last author on the case. We've been really lucky to have some joint um, pituitary MDT meetings with um, Mark's team in Cambridge. And I think, Ramesh, we've had, you know, we've had some really helpful guidance, haven't we, from this new, yep. relatively new technique about giving us more confidence surgically, which I think is what we're seeing in this case here. Did, did either of you want to comment about that? Um, yeah, so I, I would say, look, yeah, sorry, go, go, go for it, Ramesh. No, 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 Mark, I, I, you, you, there, you can go. Um, I think it's been a, a, it's been a really nice collaboration, actually, and I think the the value of the pet, I think, I sometimes describe it as sort of holding our hand a bit. It sort of just provides a bit more confidence about what we're doing. I mean, in a really good MDT with good surgeons, good radiologists, you can often. See, and I'm sure many people looking at the scan, the first images that James showed would have said, well, maybe I thought there was something on the left. But I guess we've all sat there in the MDTs where you're just scratching your head a bit saying, is it or isn't it? And I think here, uh, what we're suspecting, and, and as it happens, prolactinomas are the most avid. I mean, James showed you this is red hot. There's no question of where the abnormality is. Um, I'll leave Ramesh to comment on whether it's helpful to know really precisely where the lesion is so that you can, as it were, make that your focus for surgery yeah. and, not, and not need to manipulate the rest of the gland, really. Yeah, absolutely. I think it makes a huge difference if you have some indication as to where the target is, because often when you don't have a clear target, we are at a loss and the question then comes, often as, especially with the questions as you know, Mark and me, where we've heard on many occasions, we have to go back and re-explore many times. So in those sort of scenarios, this um, scan is really useful. As we, as, at least it will give you some, some indication as to where to explore first. Uh, and often it is successful. So I agree. Thank you, Ramesh. There's a question on the chat, which I'll go to next. And I'll ask Mark to answer, because I won't answer as eloquently or unscientifically as Mark, which is what sort of machine. Also, oh, sorry. Also, uh, also has raised his hand, so he might want to say something. Okay. I think what the way that we approach microadenoma things um, is that we we if you want to make a comment on this, we really have to hear your, your opinion. What we find with the microadenomas is that when you when you open the um, the dura, what you want to do is you want to stay well in between the superior and the inferior intercavernous sinuses. When you operate on macroadenomas, these intercavernous sinuses are often obliterated by the tumor and therefore do not bleed. But when you're operating on small tumors, you haven't got expansion of the, of the, of the contents of the fossa and therefore these intercavernous sinuses are still patent. And so what we do is we're, we're, we like to expose the, the four blues as, as they've been called, the, the cavernous sinus bilaterally and the intercavernous sinuses superior and inferiorly and stay right in between uh, so purely on dura when we open. And what we do then is that we open along the entire surface of the gland, also across what we think is going to be normal gland. Because if you have got what you think it is, is, is a distinct lesion, although you might not be sure, then you will see a clear delineation between what is abnormal tissue, i.e. tumor, and what is normal tissue, i.e. gland. 
So not only in appearance is the gland different to the tumor in that the gland looks more yellow and firm, uh, whereas the tumor can look often darker and in many Cushing's tumors um, and, and growth hormone secreting tumors, they're quite white. But the gland is also firm and quite rubbery so that when you, when you gently suck on it, it can be quite difficult to resect the tumor, whereas when you suck, uh, to, to resect the gland, whereas when you suck on the, on, the, on the tumor, the tumor comes a lot more readily. And then you can also perform quite a, a, um, a precise adenomectomy um, purely on the appearance and on the, on the suckability, if you like. And another interesting uh, um, uh, point that was made in, in the discussion is that I've also often found it a little bit confusing when you, when you look at the preoperative MRI scan and you see what appears to be a hypo intense area on one side, um, but we also appear to, and, and that, is, that is described as the likely uh, position of the tumor, but also I often see a hypo intense region on the other side of the gland, which I think, well, why isn't that also being described as tumor? But then intraoperatively, we, we often find the distinction. I don't know what Ramesh thinks about that. I agree. I think, yes, and that's true. It's, it's a bit of a concern when you have a touch like hypointense shadow on an MR on one side, and if you look at it carefully, you might see similar, similar hypointense on the other side. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think in, in situations where you do have an in, indeterminate target, and clearly biochemically everything matches up, I think those are the cases when to give more uh, sort of confidence in approaching it, I think they, these scans will be useful. Very much so. It's very nice. Thank you. Um, and Mark, Mark, I wonder, just as our, maybe our final point before we go on to the next, look, clearly we've got a big audience today. And one of the questions is around um, who can do this particular type of scan. And I've described that we're working with you and I know many centres are referring to you. So maybe did you want to just talk to us about who can be referring patients to you? Because I don't think this is really something that's on offer everywhere, is it? Thanks, Neve. So um, you're right, we, we have worked with uh, quite a number of centres up and down. And the one thing I would say is it works much better if you do it in the MDT format that we've done between ourselves and your cells with everybody there. Because I think if you're going to ask Ramesh to operate on a case, it's clearly important that he's had the full benefit of the discussion rather than us just, if you like, sending images back. The long and short of it is there's nothing really fancy about the PET CT or the, the PET MR. The images um, that James was showing you the 3D reconstructions are really much what you do with the data afterwards. So that comes from an, an academic pet physicist that we work with who, who works on producing those additional images. And, you know, whether you need those or not, I think is a matter of debate. They're interesting for teaching patients, actually, and, um, and trainees, actually, perhaps rather than the experienced neurosurgeon, as we've heard. But the long and short of it is that the limitation is the tracer. It's a short half-life tracer, so it needs to be made where there's a cyclotron. And that would limit us in the UK to about 10 or 11 centres if all of them were doing it. But you probably wouldn't want everybody doing it. I would have argued that, you know, in reality, most patients don't need this. So you probably need half a dozen centres around the UK. What we are doing at the moment is working with a new tracer, which is the fluorinated tracer. We're just about to start work with that. And if that goes ahead OK, then, for example, we could send the tracer down to you you could inject the patients so they wouldn't need to come to Cambridge. You could do it all. And then we could continue to discuss those images for the value of the, of the discussion afterwards. So I don't think we need to have it everywhere, but I think we need to have it in a few more places than it is at the moment. Thank you so much for explaining that. I am going to move on in the interest of time to the next talk. Thank you so much. That was such a lovely talk from Cambridge, beautifully illustrated and really interesting case. So we're going to move on to uh, Dr. Modi um, from Imperial. Uh, one of our um, registrars who's going to talk to us about apoplexy, a lesson in watchful waiting. So Manish, if you want to share your slides. Thank you very much. Um, and we can see you and hear you perfectly, so you can start, thank you. Excellent, um, thank you very much. And um, thank you to the organizers um, for allowing me the opportunity to present my case today. Um, so I'd like to present a case of a 33 year old lady with a background history of obesity, primary hypothyroidism and polycystic ovarian syndrome, who initially presented as a stroke thrombolysis ball to Charing Cross Hospital. So she woken overnight with a sudden onset severe left-sided headache with three associated episodes of vomiting. Subsequent to the headache, she noticed that she was unable to open or move her left eye with significant double vision, prompting her presentation to hospital. On examination in the A&E department, um, she was found to be completely alert and orientated, the GCS of 15 out of 15. 
but was noted to have a complete left ptosis with a dilated left pupil. She was also noted to have a complete left third, fourth, and sixth nerve palsy. Reassuringly, she had no deterioration in her visual acuity. She also did not demonstrate any other motor or sensory deficit on examination. In order to investigate further for the cause of her neurology, um, she went on to have a CT head and a CT intracranial angiogram performed. Now, reassuringly, there was no acute infarct or hemorrhage detected, but the CT angiogram did show some appearances which were suspicious for a short segment dissection within the left internal carotid artery, with moderate luminal narrowing as a result of the dissection. So in order to further characterize this, she went on to have an MRI and an MRA performed. So this is a, um, a T2 um, coronal section of her initial MRI, which shows a heterogeneous large cellar mass, which is extending into the left cavernous sinus. Now, this mass was thought to be compressing on the left internal carotid artery, which was um, thought to be responsible for the appearance as seen on the um, CT angiogram. There was also um, a small volume hemorrhage within the mass, which was suspicious for pituitary apoplexy. There was supracellular extension and some superior displacement of the optic chiasm, but no compression. So in light of the diagnosis of pituitary apoplexy, she appropriately received urgent treatment with IV hydrocortisone in the A&E department. She was then referred to the neurosurgical team and the endocrine team for further review and advice on ongoing management. Now, at the time of discussion with the neurosurgical team on call, um, it was decided that she wouldn't be for urgent neurosurgical intervention or decompression, particularly as her visual acuity was preserved and she was GCS 15 out of 15 and largely stable. She was planned for daily review by the pituitary neurosurgical team to monitor her progress and to revise the decision if thought to be appropriate. She was subsequently seen by our endocrinology team. So once we'd seen her, we requested that she had a pituitary profile sent um, and then we started her on regular oral prednisolone uh, to cover her for adrenal insufficiency while we were awaiting the results of the rest of her investigations. We then decided to further interrogate her history, largely focusing on the pituitary adenoma itself and whether it was hormone producing or um, a non-functioning adenoma. So interestingly, we managed to gain a lot of information after um, some targeted questions. So it turned out that um, the patient reported a 45 kilogram weight gain over the course of three years. Um, she also reported worsening acne on the face and the breasts, noticeably in the past year, as well as a more recent history of quite easy bruising over the last six months. It also turned out that she hadn't had a period for a year either. She did have hirsutism, but she reported that this was quite long-standing and may have extended over five years, and she hadn't noticed a significant deterioration in this recently. Now, interesting, you're looking through her old clinic letters um, and investigations. We found that she was actually seen by the endocrine team back in 2013 when she'd been referred um, with subfertility and weight gain. So at the time, she'd been referred because of a weight gain of 30 kilograms over the course of a 10-year period, um, and oligomenorrhea, and difficulty conceiving at the time. She went on to have a low-dose dexamethasone suppression test, which actually showed that at 48 hours, her cortisol suppressed completely to less than 20 nanomoles per liter, thereby excluding a diagnosis of Cushing syndrome at the time. She was then diagnosed with PCOS and commenced on metformin. And then she was able to successfully conceive at some point between um, four or five years ago. So on examination, on a more targeted examination, she was found to have a plethoric moon face with an interscapular fat pad. She had significant acne scarring on the face with moderate hirsutism. She had central obesity and, as, and actually weighed 146 kilograms on admission. She did have multiple bruises on her arms as she had previously reported. She didn't herself have any um, subjective difficulty in climbing stairs or raising her arms, but she did have difficulty rising from a squatted position when assessed um, by the bedside. She did have silvery striae, which she reports developed over the last two years, but they weren't the typical violaceous um, striae that we'd expect with Cushing's. However, given her history, her clinical picture, her examination, and her pituitary MRI, the overall picture was thought to be consistent with undiagnosed Cushing's disease, presenting for the first time as pituitary apoplexy. So the pituitary profile that was sent off um, showed a raised TSH and a low T4, which would be consistent with her diagnosis of primary hypothyroidism. Her gonadotropins were low um, and her prolactin level was also lower than the low limit of normal. Interestingly, her cortisol level came back as more than 3,300 nanomoles per litre, but we strongly suspect that this may have been sent after she'd received the IV hydrocortisone A&E, which was the completely appropriate management in the emergency setting. 
So she was admitted for further observation and subsequently discussed at the Imperial Pituitary MDT. And after extensive discussion, the overall conclusion recommendation was to proceed with conservative management with close surveillance. And the rationale of this is as follows. So throughout from presentation through to her discussion at the MDT, she retained a normal visual acuity, normal visual fields, which were assessed as an inpatient with some difficulty because her left eyelid had to be manually raised to assess her visual fields, and a normal GCS throughout the admission. And this would be consistent with the published SFP guidelines from 2016 in the management pituitary apoplexy. So a conservative management was proposed. So after a few days of observation, we started to make plans regarding her discharge, and a part of that would be to decide on ongoing glucocorticoid replacement. So we checked a 9 a.m. cortisol prior to her dose of prednisolone in the morning and found that her cortisol was 513 nanomoles per litre, with a paired ACTH of 117 nanograms per litre, suggesting that her cortisol is largely driven by pituitary ACTH or ACTH. Um, and in light of this, we decided to actually discontinue her glucocorticoid replacement. Now, while she was still in hospital for observation, we also decided to do an overnight dexamethasone suppression test for her, um, which showed that she actually failed to suppress her cortisol only to 155 nanomoles per litre after receiving one milligram of dexamethasone the night before. In light of a low T4, we also increased her levothyroxine dosing. Um, we couldn't really use her TSH as an accurate marker given the acute apoplexy. And then she was planned for discharge and then weekly review in the endocrine clinic to monitor her, to her clinical progress and her neurology. So at six weeks, um, she was actually found to have complete resolution of her left-sided ptosis and complete normalization of her left eye movements, which over the six-week period had gradually been seen to be improving. She still complained of some minimal residual double vision on left lateral gaze only, so quite a significant improvement from her initial presentation. At this point, she had a repeat MRI performed, and I've just put the images up from her initial MRI on the left and her repeat MRI on the right. So you can see that there's this initially, there's this heterogeneous cellar mass with supracellar extension uh, on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, the pituitary gland has returned to a normal size with resolution of that heterogeneous signal. It was also reported that on her repeat MRI, there was a hypo-enhancing region on the left side of the pituitary, possibly consistent with a five millimeter microadenoma. So at three months um, following the apoplexy event, she was actually very happy to report that she'd lost approximately six kilograms in weight and was now down to 140 kilograms. Her gonadotropin levels were seen to be normalizing as well as her prolactin and growth hormone, but her periods were yet to resume. We also arranged a few serial cortisol day curves on our investigations unit, which I'll present the results on the next slide. So here you can see, so two days after she had that failed overnight dexamethasone suppression test, she attended for a cortisol day curve, which as you, you can appreciate, all of her cortisol levels are less than 80 nanomoles per litre, which raised some concern that whether she was still adrenally insufficient. So we restarted her on prednisolone as a safe measure um, to cover her. She then subsequently stayed on prednisolone for another month where she attended for another cortisol um, day curve. So she would miss her dose of cortisol in the morning and then went on to have this cortisol day curve, which you can see looks like she's starting to recover some of her diurnal cortisol secretion. Based on her values on this day curve, her prednisolone was once again stopped um, and she remained clinically well until we reviewed her two months after, so three months after the initial apoplexy event. And you can actually see that her cortisol, her endogenous cortisol production um, is actually very reassuring. And if anything, it's continuing to rise off prednisolone. So in summary, I presented a case of a 33-year-old lady who's presenting with pituitary apoplexy on a background of likely undiagnosed Cushing's disease. There is also a suspicion that the apoplexy event itself may have induced remission initially in her undiagnosed Cushing's disease. I think most importantly, the take home message from this case is that it highlights that conservative management, even in the context of quite significant cranial nerve pathology, has resulted in a good outcome in terms of complete resolution of the cranial nerve pathology within six weeks. And we're starting to see recovery of her pituitary hormone secretion. So I proposed a few questions for discussion, but I'm happy to discuss other points as well. But it's how best can we monitor this patient for a relapse of her suspected Cushing's disease? And also, can we be sure that Cushing's disease was the initial diagnosis, given her lack of histological or biochemical confirmation? Thank you very much for listening. I'd like to thank my co-authors as well um, for the interview on this case. Thank you. Thank you, Manish. That was really clear. Um, I'm just going to look through um, our 
uh, participants for a minute and see if I can see any hands up. Um, in the meantime, I wonder, we've definitely got two surgeons here because we've got Ramesh Nair um, and we've got Mr. Barazi. And I wondered if either of you wanted to comment from this neurosurgical point of view and this um, apoplexy in the context of a patient who we've heard has got normal acuity, normal fields, <clears throat> excuse me, in a normal GCS and possibly a functional tumour at this point in terms of the history that we heard about possible um, Cushing's disease. And, and I wondered about your thoughts about, about yeah, the, the management yeah. of the apoplexy. Yeah, I think it, it was an interesting case. I think it's Nigel who dealt with this case, but generally as surgeons, when you have someone with apoplexy or a mass lesion causing acute neurological deficit, either visual compromise or, or cranial nerve deficit uh, leading to ophthalmoplegia, the first inclination is to offer surgery. And that, that's what, and that logically thinking, that is what we should be doing to decompress the, the tumor or the cavernous sinus so that you can take off that effect on that uh, nerves. But here, um, it seems that um, the, uh, the tumor got itself cured by, by uh, spontaneous resolution after the initial hemorrhage. We didn't go in. I suspect because there was no acute visual loss um, related to the apoplexy or the swelling of the tumor. And it is debatable whether for other cranial nerves like uh, um, um, third nerve or sixth nerve, whether uh, the, uh, intervening acutely, but it's going to make a, a, a difference to the, the, the long-term outcome. In this, in this case, clearly, with uh, conservative management, patient did well, which is, uh, I think, an excellent. And it's, it's probably not all, all the, the, the case all the time. It's sometimes, most often you see that patient may persist to have a uh, ophthalmoplegia even for longer term. I think so overall, it's a good outcome in this case. And the second point is that um, this was a functioning case. So even otherwise, there was an indication to consider surgery in such cases when you know that there is a functioning tumor and causing visual compromise or other cranial palsy. But in this case, the whole, even, even the functional problem also got resolved. So I, I find it very interesting, but this is not the, the case always. You know, this is good in, in hindsight, but in many cases we would go in and debulk. Uh, Sinan, you. You, what do you think? I agree with all those points, Ramesh, absolutely. Uh, the, the, what we've observed as King, at King's is that, um, so we were, a few years ago, we would, we would uh, quite frequently manage these conservatively in the absence of any loss of visual acuity, even with an ophthalmoplegia. But then we started to see an emergence of, 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 of patients who, uh, despite no uh, visual acuity loss and extension into the cavernous sinus, did suffer with extreme headaches. And so we would step in um, early on these cases to try and alleviate their severe headaches. And we often found that within even a day of, uh, of surgery, the ophthalmoplegia would start to resolve. So, so I don't know if you have that experience as well, Ramesh. Usually with, with conservative management, um, the ophthalmoplegia can take, as in this case, several weeks uh, to resolve. I think this, this case took six weeks. Um, but with surgical intervention and decompression of the cavernous sinus contents, you know, we very frequently see a, a, an improvement in ophthalmoplegia within, within a day or two. I agree. I think that, that's quite, I mean, I've seen that as well in, in many cases uh, coming with uh, ophthalmoplegia. I, I think overall we have to say the resolution will be quicker with uh, a surgical intervention. Yeah. But there may be other factors, we, especially in cases of the Cushing with a lot of medical morbidities and there, many factors may have, prom, may have prompted us to, to, to deal with otherwise. But yeah. I agree, I think uh, surgical intervention is often more uh, uh, resolution wise is probably more prompt. Um, I can see Arthur uh, wants to say something. Any, yes, I was about to ask. We've got look, we've got two neurosurgeons. So if we go to Arthur first and then Eleni. So Arthur, please do uh, join in. Hi there. So this was Nigel's case, Nigel Mendoza, but I do recall discussing it with him. And surgery was offered. He did offer the patient surgery, but um, she, first off, she was a little bit reluctant to. And I think some of the preoptive, some of those discussions were kind of challenging. Um, but unfortunately, they're just the numbers of these sorts of cases are quite low volume. So there's just sadly no good quality evidence really to, to really give us to give patients the, the actual chance that this, the nerve function is going to improve. Um, so uh, that was the difficulty, really. We weren't able to say to her how, how likely it was that the ophthalmoplegia would improve. Um, 
and she was pretty reluctant to undergo an operation. So that was why we decided on conservative management. But aside you, from that, you know, I do agree with the points that Ramesh and Sinan have made. When you do look at do a literature search, you do come across mostly case reports, really, or a very small series demonstrating some improvement in ophthalmoplegia post-op. But it is really nice to see um, the opposite, the flip side, that it can happen with conservative management as well. Thank you. Eleni, um, it would be great to have your neurosurgical um, input about this. What, please tell us your thoughts. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to go back to the, the, the comment at the beginning that commented on a possible um, intracranial cavernous carotid dissection, um, because it reminded me of a couple of cases that we've had at King's that have had vasospasm associated with apoplexy. Um, so I just wanted to flag that up and say, was this possible in this case? Was this a case of vasospasm? And that's what caused the narrowing of the, of the lumen of the, the artery, or was it definitely a dissection? Um, Manish, I think we actually excluded a dissection, didn't we, on, on subsequent um, investigations. I think it was flagged initially on that CT, but then we excluded it. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so after she had the MRI and the MRA, they actually said all of the appearances were consistent with compression um, and not actually a dissection. So that was actually excluded after the MRA. And, and there was no spasm on the intracranial vessels? No, there was no mention of it the from, the, from the scan reports, no. Okay, thanks. Um, so a couple of questions on the and the chat and, so, and some um, responses from Corinne. So um, in terms of how sure we are that this is Cushing's, some very interesting questions around, um, you know, a, a, lot, or a lot of her high cortisol uh, readings and her failure, for example, to suppress on a dexamethasone suppression test, not in the context of a patient who's unwell and in hospital, which are all really good points. And I think that's clearly why Manish has uh, talked to us about some of the specifics around her history um, and her examination findings in that um, you're quite right, um, Anna, in terms of, of course, you know, I, I would be very reluctant to place much weight on an inpatient overnight dexamethasone suppression test, but I guess it was in the context of her having all these clinical symptoms and clinical signs of hypercortalism and a pituitary tumour. Um, but nevertheless, it's a really, it's a really well-made point. Uh, and I think we've also said on the chat, what's really interesting is back in 2013, when she was presented with some of these symptoms, she actually suppressed to less than uh, 20 nanomoles per litre on an overnight dexamethasone suppression test. So Krim's point is also well-made that as we all know, when we scratch our head for difficult Cushing syndrome, uh, is this Cushing syndrome or not? Um, there's a lot of overlap, for example, with PCOS. There's large numbers of patients uh, with Cushing syndrome who have polycystic ovaries, and, it, and it's very difficult. Um, and I think, um, really, we've decided to watch and wait where we are. But the, the last cortisol day curve that you saw there, where she looks as if her cortisol burden is going up again, is making us feel more um, confident that she probably has got functionality again. And uh, the plan is for um, her to have... Um, an outpatient uh, overnight dexamethasone suppression test. And Debbie's quite right that what we really wanted to do was squeeze in all these results just before the Imperial Pituitary Masterclass, but we couldn't quite do that. So uh, it'll be hot off the press next week, but we haven't got the results of her overnight for the meeting um, now that she's a few months down the line. So listen, thank you, Manish. <clears throat> That was really interesting. And as I say, I've promised to stick to time this afternoon to make sure we finish on time. So um, I'm going to move on to the next case, which is Dr. Ayub, and this is a case from King's. Um, so Dr. Ayub, if you could um, share your screen and we can get started with your case, that will be wonderful. You just now, need to yeah, I can't hear you. Yeah, I can see yeah, it. Sorry. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you for um, uh, accepting this um, case presentation, which I'm, I'm presenting uh, on behalf of, of my team at King's College. Um, So the presentation, this is a 43-year-old um, lady came to UK from Eritrea 11 years ago. 
she presented on Christmas Eve with progressive decline in visual act, uh, equity um, over four weeks. On examination uh, of her vision, her right eye, she has only perception of light and also only can see hand movement in her left eye. The history presenting complaints started uh, late November uh, with uh, misty vision uh, in left eye, then broke this to the right eye. She was seen by optician and cataract was diagnosed. Then 10 days uh, later, she presented to another hospital uh, emergency department with an episode of left temporal headache and mild photophobia. And the examination showed um, vision in right eye, only counting fingers and uh, improved to six over 60 with pinhole and her vision six over 24 in the left eye. OCT was done at, was normal in both eyes so she was referred to the cataract uh, clinic from there. Now on her presentation, because the, the, there was progressive um, reduction in her vision, uh, urgent CT head and CT orbits was done in the emergency department. And a, it showed um, a bulky uh, pituitary fossa and also a extension of so, sort of soft tissue mass here, like in the supracellar uh, region. So an urgent uh, pituitary MRI was done. And these are the images. Oh, we can see um, very bulky uh, pituitary gland um, uh, and uh, extension of the enhancement in gadolinium to the supracellar uh, legion and infundibulum. And also there is this enhancement in the uh, coronal section um, surrounding the uh, pre-chiasmatic um, optic apparatus and also in the uh, it was um, uh, surrounding the optic chiasma as well uh, in, in other sections. So she was seen uh, by the endocrine team on review. Um, the only endocrine symptoms she has uh, is amenorrhea uh, for six months. Uh, periods were regular before that. She's not on oral contraceptions. She has five children, the youngest age 14 years. At the moment, she has no headache. Uh, it's only one episode of headache that um, occurred around 20 days earlier. There's no breast tenderness, no galacturia, nausea, vomiting, or lethargy, um, and no bulliuria or symptoms of DI, no other symptoms or signs of endocrinopathy. Her past medical history is significant only for kidney stone and cesarean section delivery. So um, blood tests, uh, CRB and ESR and in general renal and uh, liver profile were normal. The only thing was um, slightly elevated total protein and mildly reduced potassium. And uh, coming to her uh, pituitary function, TSH was low, free T4 was 2.9, um, cortisol as well, and gonadotrophins. And her prolactin was less than 20 and uh, confirmed by diluted sample. And her IGF-1 was 5.4. So she has um, a picture of uh, burn hypobituitarism. So uh, my question for now, what, what, what do you think about differential diagnosis uh, about what we had till now? Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to ask you, would you mind terribly uh, going back through your presentation to where the um, slides of the MRI imaging is for a second. Is that okay? I, yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah, and then I can it. see, I don't mean to pick on poor Luke Dixon, but I know that Luke Dixon is, is in the audience and is one of our neuroradiologists. And I wondered, Luke, would you mind talking us through, seeing we've got some time and uh, you will be the, the, the expert, certainly compared to me, in terms of talking us through the findings here in terms of this slightly unusual looking pituitary MRI. Hi, uh, yeah, uh, just about, I'm in the reporting room, so I have to speak a bit Sorry, quietly, Luke, but thank you. No, don't worry. Um, this is quite nice, actually, because you remember that we had that case last week and there was the, from elsewhere and there was a debate about whether it was a hypothesitis versus a adenoma. 
And I was talking about how it respected the compartments. Um, so in this case, it's the exact opposite. So this, this patient's um, abnormal enhancement is crossing different boundaries and then sort of surrounding those areas as well. So as well as surrounding the um, optic, uh, the systemic optic nerves, it's also surrounding the dura. And you can see, um, I can't really show on the images, but you can see that there's dura, sort of low um, signal dura that's then surrounded by this enhancing tissue, the sort of the darker lines that you're seeing. So it's, it's sort of crossing those boundaries and then surrounding it, um, which is very good for an inflammatory process. Um, if it was a neoplastic process, you'd expect there to be more mass effect related to that and things being pushed or even um, reaching the dura, but this is sort of just surrounding everything and engulfing it, um, which is very good for inflammation and granulomatous processes as well. Um, in terms of uh, other clues to sort of help it, is, there's also a slightly um, crenulated appearance to it. You can see that there's sort of a slightly bumpy sort of furry margin on the, on the um, enhancement, um, which is different to what you see with a, an adenoma or a tumor, which is usually more well-marginated. Um, and it sort of blurs a bit with this adjacent um, uh, stalk. If you look on the sagittal imaging, it's sort of where the, where the stalk is versus where this enhancing tissue is, it's hard to discriminate and separate. And again, that's, that's nice for an inflammatory process. Um, I guess the other differential would be, uh, say, a dural process like um, uh, uh, LCH or erdem chester histiocytic process, um, and that would be on the list, um, but would be, you know, is even rarer than hypothesitis. Um, and again, the way it's sort of moulding around structures as opposed to distorting them is it goes a bit against that as well. Um, the pituitary itself looks relatively preserved, doesn't it, as well? And you can sort of separate the pituitary gland from this um, abnormal tissue. Um, so I haven't got the benefit of any of other, any other slices, but um, is there a T2 out of curiosity? Did you have a T2 scan? Oh, uh, no, unfortunately I don't have it. Uh, no, don't worry. Yeah. No, no, don't worry. Um, yeah. Just the reason I ask for it, that is sometimes on T2 with these um, inflammatory processes, um, they're a bit lower on signal. So a lot of um, pathology, um, including adenomas, are a bit on the higher side of T2, but um, these inflammatory processes, which are slightly less, um, uh, when the processes which have granulomatous processes, particularly, they have a bit less fluid in them. So they're usually a bit lower on T2. And there's, there's not many things that are lower on T2. So that's another clue sometimes. Um, it doesn't help you differentiate which one. Um, so TB, sarcoid, IgG4, all of those. Um, but it does help, it pushes you more towards that, um, that broad category of process. Thank you, Luke. That was enormously helpful. Now, can yeah. I, that, that really helped me certainly to, yeah. to, to understand a bit more about what we're looking at. Can I just check, Dr. Ayub? I worry I've been terribly rude and jumped in a bit soon. Had you finished your presentation? Have you got more oh, slides? No, not We've yet. got plenty Sorry, of yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick there, thanks. No, don't, you don't need to be quick. We've got plenty of time, so go back to yeah. where you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we yeah, had to look sure. at the MRI, which was great. Thank you. Yeah. So, so what, what happened is that, I mean, because the patient was pre um, presenting on the um, Christmas Eve and um, she has this uh, a marked reduction in, in, in her vision, we had um, uh, over the phone MDT discussion uh, by the endocrine consultant, uh, the neurosurgeon and neuroradiologist, and uh, we decided to start her on um, um, IV um, methylprednisolone, uh, one gram, for three days and to monitor her vision um, um, closely. And uh, she will have a transphenoidal biopsy, but also uh, with consideration of surgical intervention if there is no improvement. Uh, subsequent tests were done, chest X-ray to rule out TV or sarcoid was normal, and IgG uh, subclasses where the results came back later and was normal. Um, so on day two, after receiving one dose of uh, methylprednisolone, her visual ac acuity was um, much better in both eyes, and her fundoscopy showed normal macular and optic discs in, uh, in both eyes. Her visual fields on confrontation showed um, subarotemporal defect in, in, in both eyes and also um, nasal defect in, in the left eye. But there was a marked improvement in, in her vision. So she received another one gram of methylprednisolone in, on day two, and we've done an MRI uh, in day three, which we, you can see here um, a marked reduction in, in, in 
in volume of the pituitary gland compared to uh, what was in the initial imaging, as well as reduction of the enhancement both in the pituitary gland and the um, uh, surrounding of pre-chiasmatic um, uh, optic apparatus. Uh, on day three, she had a transphenoidal biopsy uh, from her pituitary gland. The histopathology showed inflammatory and granulomatous legion there was intense infiltration by lymphocytes, and there, were, uh, there was also um, one place of um, caseous necrosis. Staining for zealous and stain, gram uh, stain, and uh, crocodile stains were negative. Uh, the culture of the uh, sample was negative, but un unfortunately, the uh, uh, TB culture was not uh, performed. So um, on day four, she was started on prednisolone, 40 milligrams once a day, and levothyroxine. And uh, after MDT discussion as well, she was started on anti-TB treatment by uh, tuberculosis team, as she's coming from an um, endemic area, and the histology showed granulomatous um, uh, inflammation. Subsequent results, uh, we've done quantiferon test, uh, which was positive. We also done um, ASIN uh, level to um, rule out sarcoidosis and it was normal. Um, and uh, this is her um, visual field for um, two month follow up, which is apparently normal, apart from um, spiraling in the um, left eye. Her visual acuity was six over nine on both eyes at two months. Um, her Goldman fields were, uh, as you uh, saw, individual fields. Her OCT at the moment showed a moderate decrease of um, written nerve fiber uh, layer thickness in the right eye inferiorly, and um, again, the temporal area in the left eye, which was not uh, there in the initial uh, OCT. Uh, we've done also chest CT to make sure that uh, we are not missing any uh, lung pathology and there is no ev there was no evidence of uh, pulmonary granulomatous disease. There was a uh, finding of seven millimeter nodule, which is under follow up. And, and then uh, she was seen in the clinic seven month, uh, seven month follow up and she continued to improve clinically and radiologically. And um, she's now continued on pituitary um, replacement, mainly prednisolone um, and levothyroxine. Prednisolone is stable to 20 milligram at the moment. Um, unfortunately, she, she was due to have um, follow up this month, but she's um, uh, on holiday abroad. So we were unable to get uh, more details about follow up. So in summary, I presented the 43-year-old lady uh, presented with progressive visual loss over four weeks. Uh, biochemical and radi radiological evaluation was in keeping with hypophysitis. She was treated with IV pulse uh, methylprednisolone to try to reduce the inflammation and um, restore her vision. There was dramatic improvement in vision and signs of inflammation. And she was diagnosed with granulomatous hypophysitis following a biopsy. Uh, which we think is likely um, TB induced, and uh, she's now on prednisone and anti TB treatment. Uh, and my final question is about uh, we all know that biopsy is important for diagnosis of hypophysitis, but uh, what are the circumstances that you could consider medical treatment like starting local corticoids before um, the biopsy? And thank you. Thank you so much. That was lovely. And thank you to your pa for your patience in terms of allowing us to look at that imaging in a bit more detail and get a bit more learning from that. I wondered, Ramesh, would you be able to just speak to us for a minute? I know that within our MDT, we often have a lot of discussion around the pros and cons of, uh, of steroids with inflammatory looking lesions and whether that then prevents us from biopsying something down the line, although in this case, this was a biopsy quite quickly afterwards. And I know we've spent a lot of time discussing that where we've wanted tissue and we didn't want the lesion to regress too much. What what are your thoughts about yeah. Uh, yeah. that in this yeah, context? Thanks, Dave. I agree. I think this is uh, not an uncommon condition we encounter uh, in our practice. And often you know, we have an idea about the possible diagnosis from the history itself because often these patients are more symptomatic, I would say disproportionately symptomatic than some of the standard pituitary tumors we see with non-functioning adenomas. 
and also the visual compromise. That's also interesting. It's, you don't see a typical visual field a deficit in the case. Often there's a irregular, irregular deficit or even loss in acuity, which is not really a standard finding for a standard non-functioning pituitary adenoma. So these are the things which you will uh, make you suspicious that you, you uh, make you suspicious that this could be something else. Um, and in most of the elective situation, when there is no urgency, the role for the neurosurgeons to get a biopsy, so they can establish a diagnosis and then carry on with any other medical management. Or also to even if it's inflammatory, there may be different subtypes. For example, IG4 or tuberculosis or granular matter. So these are the things which we need to find out from a biopsy. But in since several situations like this one, when you have a patient with a slightly larger tumor, possibly compromising the chiasm, and, and uh, you don't know whether this is a, a, a tumor-related issue or whether this is a, a, a hypophysitis, then this is when you, you consider a, a surgical intervention as an emergency situation where we have uh, had a pressure from the neuro-ophthalmologist saying that this is causing problems. And so I have found those in such cases um, during the operation, they are different than a normal pituitary tumor. Often you find that tumor is very fibrotic and, and not able to restrict it at all. In fact, you can't restrict it without causing a problem. And I forgot to mention many of these tumors, uh, the patient symptomatology may include panhypopituitarism and, uh, as you know, diabetes insipidus, which is not common with the standard tumors. But um, in terms of the actual uh, diagnosis, one thing which Luke uh, also was mentioning about the situated appearance, you, you often see the edema spreading into the chiasm or including the optic um, tract and the, uh, the posterior visual pathways, which are all unusual findings. But overall, I think the surgical intervention will give you a definite diagnosis and also um, the subtype of the inflammatory uh, pathology, but often it's not a, a, a uh, uh, so the intention is not to debulk the tumor or, or to take any pressure off because trying to, to try and remove the tumor is likely to damage whatever pituitary function that's left behind. If there is adherence to the optic uh, apparatus, that's going, that can be even more riskier. So my practice is usually to get a generous, generous biopsy um, uh, in majority of cases. Thank you. And just Briefly, Florian, I can see that you're on, and I know you've got a special clinical interest in inflammatory pituitary disease. Was there anything that you wanted to add in this context? Very interesting, very unusual to have granulomas as hypophysitis. Was there anything you wanted to add before we move on to the last case? Well, no, thank you. It's a very interesting case, and we had a very similar case recently, didn't we, in, in, in our MDT. I agree with Ramesh. So it, it, I think it's really important to get a biopsy because we have many patients now in our clinic who will be on long-term treatment and they are often quite young and it's really important to know what we are treating if you commit someone to long-term immunosuppressive treatment and and almost all of them or most of them are very steroid responsive and unless we have a tissue diagnosis we'll never know what they actually what it actually is and um, it will come back in many cases sometimes not but um, I think a biopsy uh, can be really helpful. If there's an emergency, then I would also agree with Ramesh, then treatment obviously takes priority and, and the biopsy can be done later if necessary. Thank you, Florian, that was really helpful. So look, well done everybody for concentrating all afternoon and we're on the, the last case, can you believe? Um, and this is a case that comes from Hillingdon. Dr. Nayunt is going to present this. So if you could share your slides. This is our last case of the afternoon. Hi, can you see me? I can see you. I can't see any slides just yet, but I can see you, if that makes sense. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, perfect. We can see your desktop now. So if you move that thing out of the way. Yep. Great. Perfect. We can see and hear you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sandy. Um, I just would like to present this interesting case on behalf of our Hillenden team. And we call this as an endocrinopathy behind the face mask. So this is a 44-year-old gentleman uh, 
presented to A&E with uh, two weeks history of fevers, rigors, and generally unwell. His past medical history was um, hypertension and tension headaches, which he was on remipril and imitriptyline. The clinical findings are the um, ECG show he's got new onset AF with rapid ventricular response and the blood shows that he's got um, raised inflammatory markers with dynamic uh, troponin rise. Interestingly, his troponins were from normal and the second one jumped up to 10,000 and he has urgent angiogram was done, which was uh, normal and which was followed by echocardiograph by cardiology teams and which shows that he's got the um, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Um, and also we did a little bit history and he may have some uh, cardiomyopathy or uh, left ventricular hypertrophy in the past, but there was no echo to prove that. And there are some vegetations on mitral valve, which was uh, confirmed by the TOE. At the same time, the blood cultures were positive for streptococcus aurelis. Um, and that he had a history of the uh, recent dental work a month ago, and that was that was kind of interesting as well. Um, therefore, he was treated as an infective endocarditis with IV antibiotics. Um, at that time, he was under care of the cardiology team on that mission, and uh, cardiology team started Epixerb and Bisoprolol and Amiodrone for his AF and HOCAM. Um, and then uh, because patient has been on IV antibiotics for four weeks and his um, eye infective endocarditis uh, were not uh, completely resolved and he was transferred to the tertiary cardiac center for mitral valve replacement. It was an eventful procedure he recovered well and they switched his epic servant to warfarin post-operatively. During the admission in that cardiac center and they investigated his uh, chronic headache, but at that time they were more acute on chronic headache. He had a CT scan of his head first followed by the MRI head. And this is his MRI uh, pituitary. And um, as we can see that he's got um, pituitary macroadenoma, um, sizes around 3.8 to um, 1.8 centimeter. Um, no Kavana sinus invasion, um, but there are suprastellar extension and uh, is uh, abutting the optic chiasm. Um, and at that point, he was referred to the um, endocrine for the urgent endocrine um, management. So uh, from this point, um, based on the clinical presentations and all these treatment and management, uh, what would be the most uh, likely diagnosis? Um, I have this Mentimeter. I don't know whether I can share that. The problem is that they're not registered on your thing, right? So I've put a poll up and they can answer it. So go back to your choices. Yes. The slide. Yeah? yeah, it's all right. You can each join. So here we go. They've got five choices, okay? And they can choose choice one, two, three, four, or five, which are next to your five options. So number one is prolactinobar, two is acromegaly, and three is Cushion's disease, four is non-functioning pituitary adenoma, and TSH secreting pituitary adenoma. Okay, so come on, everybody. There's 216 of you joined, and oh, I think it's going quite well. I can see people answering the question. So I'll give you a few more seconds, and then I will see. This is a new thing with Zoom that I'm just testing out. The, the problem for Menti is that everybody needs to join before. Yeah, with the code. And then right. the other one. So shall I reveal then? I'll give you all five more seconds. There we go. And then I can share. Can you see that, everybody? Yes. No. So choice two has got 39%. Um, that worked very well, actually. Well done, Corinne. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yes, it is correct. Um, even though there's not a lot of investigations and blood works will come in a bit. And uh, yeah, the diagnosis most likely based on this cardio cardiac 
comorbidities and everything is an acromegaly, which is confirmed in our clinic. So um, when he attended the clinics, he removed his face mask uh, in the clinic room. And then he had this typical acromegalic features with supraorbital rich prominence and significant underbite and microglossia. Um, visual fees are normal, no organomegaly. He hasn't, he hasn't got obstructively apneas or any other um, comorbidity so far. He has no family history of the endocrine disease um, or any man syndrome, anything there. And blood shows that, um, especially the pituitary profile show that he got the uh, significantly raised IGF-1, which is 140. Normal 90M cortisol, high prolactin at 1000 and normal TSH, suppressed FSH and um, low testosterone. And we did the uh, OGTT to confirm the uh, acromegaly, which we can see that he has got a, a paradoxical uh, rise level of the uh, growth hormone. So again, um, I'm, I'm sorry about the mentimeter, but um, what- That's all right, I'll do it again. You can do that again. Do you want this, can we get this five option, do I try? So what is the best management uh, for this patient? And uh, number one is radiotherapy, number two is surgery, three is octreotide, uh, four is radiotherapy, followed by surgery, and five is octreotide, followed by surgery. So his, again, his, Pituitary macrogenoma, 3.8 to 1.8 centimeter. He's got a supracellar extension and a budding optic hyacin, but no uh, cave on a sinus invasion. And uh, please don't be sorry, because Crumb's been desperate to try out this Zoom poll all afternoon. So we've given him a perfect opportunity to do so. So it's all worked <laughs> yeah. out perfectly. Okay, here we go. Let me just end it and uh, share the results. Okay, what do you think? So choice two, which is surgery, is what more than half of the group want to do. Mm -hmm. And then a third want to go for option five, which was optotype surgery. surgery. Okay. Uh, so yes, it's a, um, it's part, it's, it's correct. Um, I think uh, we would do the uh, optotype followed by the surgery. Um, so he is, sorry. So he was uh, urgently referred to the Charing Cross Hospital and seen in the pituitary MDT clinic. And they started him on lanreotype monthly injections. And the plan is um, to give three months of the uh, injections and um, lanreotype injections to um, reduce the tumor size followed by um, transferenoidal surgery planned uh, tentatively in November. Uh, I just want to touch uh, very quickly about acromegaly, which we all know, and this is a condition of the chronic excessive circulating levels of growth hormone in adults. And due to the high level of growth hormone insulin-like growth factor, one results in systemic alterations, making these acromegalic features. And 99% of them are growth hormone secreting pituitary adenoma, and 1% is ectopic secretion of growth hormone. There are few familiar cases as well, including man type one. Um, there are complications of the um, well-known complications of acromegaly, uh, including metabolic and endocrine, uh, such as diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, hyperprolactinemia, and in cardiovasculars like our patient, hypertension, biventricular hypertrophy, heart failure, arrhythmia, vaculopathy, and also OSA, colonic polyps, and arthropathy. So what are the challenges in acromegaly, um, including our, like, for, for example, our patients, like it is an insidious disease and the onset of symptoms to diagnosis may take five to 10 years. And the diagnosis delay in acromegaly are very, well, uh, very common and very well recognized. Um, for example, our patient, the patient has had a hypertension diagnosed in 2016 and headaches 2020. Again, these symptoms are very common and these, these diseases are common in the, in the public, so it's, dif it's difficult to point out. And the patients may already have one or more complications when acromegaly is, or diagnosis is established. And because of this comorbidities, that could also implicate the outcomes or the surgeries itself. Um, so in summary, 
Um, this 44-year-old gentleman with previously a fairly stable patient background, hypertension and um, headaches, presented with infective endocarditis, and he's currently on um, warfarin for his mitral valve replacement, MU drone, and bisoprolol. He's got atrial fibrillations, he's got hokum, and he has this mitral valve replacement, and he's on warfarin. So um, the questions... I would like to ask to the audience or the experts is that number one, would earlier diagnosis of his, his acromegaly have changed his cardiovascular outcome? And number two is that what are the challenges in his ongoing management resulting from his significant cardiovascular comorbidity? Uh, thank you. Thank you. That was a really lovely case, an excellent use of Zoom polls and um, <clears throat> really, um, telling for us all um, that here we are on uh, Zoom uh, 18 months after, after the start of COVID. And here we've got a patient who, because of face masks, maybe remote consultations may have been picked up early, as you say. We're, we're a specialty that needs to see our patients to make a diagnosis as well as talk to them. James, I'll be interested for your thoughts, please. Well, I just love the presentation. I'm not, I'm not going to answer either of the questions, I'm afraid, but I've been doing telephone consultations for the last 18 months and worrying about missing diagnoses. And when I teach on this, which is an important part of training in a crisis, I've been teaching that there are some diagnoses that you really feel very vulnerable about. And one is Cushing's and the other is acromegaly. Uh, I haven't yet knowingly missed a patient with acromegaly but it's very nice that you've presented one that presented in this extraordinary way. Um, telephone is even worse than behind a face mask. We've been doing attend anywhere video conferencing for our pituitary follow up, and that's been immensely reassuring. But um, I don't know if you've noticed when the patient takes the mask off. You understand their face so much better. Uh, just examining them with the mask on. I feel as I'm missing a lot of endocrine information. And what I've learned is that there's an awful lot of information to be held between the chin and the bridge of the nose. It's quite extraordinary. I never knew I was so dependent on that for examination. I actually find it hard to, to diagnose thyroid eye disease with a face mask on. That's a curious thing. Um, one sense of perspective about the face is completely distorted by the face mask. So I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, James. I really hear you. And I think we miss a lot of um, our nonverbal cues as well with a face mask on, don't we? Which is also really challenging in terms of our, um, our interactions with patients. So, I, gosh, I second everything you've said. Just scrolling through, is there anyone else that wanted to put their hand up? I was going to ask Ramesh or any of the other surgeons on if they wanted to comment on the cardiovascular comorbidity and surgery, because obviously we've got this man who's had a challenging cardiology time in terms of his AF and his hokum. Um, we're going to head towards an operation tentatively scheduled for uh, November. So I don't know if there were any neurosurgeons who wanted to comment on the, uh, the relevance of that in terms of surgery. And Sandy, do you want to just go back to the slide with the imaging? Yeah. Yeah, is that the only slide you have or? Sorry, yeah, that's the only slide. I okay. Have. Well, I mean, I'm sorry, I missed the first half of the uh, presentation, but uh, it seems the problem with these patients with acromegaly and cardiomyopathy, often they may be on some anticoagulation and they have a, a very uh, a reduced ejection fraction and they may not be fit for an anesthetic procedure. And it's often uh, like a, a loop. You have to get the patient treated for acromegaly to get their cardiac function better on, and also. Uh, but the other way, also, they are cardiac high risk for a surgical procedure and vaginal anesthesia. So you have to find an optimum uh, balance and optimize the patient as much as you can before you take these patients out for, for uh, surgical intervention. These, this particular tumor seems to be very uh, well defined and not invaded in the cavernous sinus process. So I, I think you know, at the first opportunity to intervene, I would be keen to take this tumor out to optimize him further. Uh, I'm not sure how bad his cardiac functions are, but I'm sure with some medical management that can be optimized. And but only thing with the optimization with the medical management is that uh, it will mess up with your post-operative uh, assessment of the recovery from the acromegaly. But that's a, a very small price to pay for 
optimizing while waiting for the surgical intervention. Ramesh, presumably, um, in terms of uh, when we've thought about, when I mean, we've had a number of patients with quite a lot of cardiovascular complications from their acromegaly, haven't we? And presumably, it's the anaesthetist that we need, would need to get involved early who'd have to feel confident uh, because there's also an issue sometimes when we've got patients with obstructive sleep apnea and then uh, ventilation post Absolutely. And things. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. And, and many of these patients, like from Magali, they have uh, sleep disorders and they have obstetric um, issues, often use a, a CPAP machine at home. So we surgically will be very careful about their, uh, because often use, as you know, as Sina might uh, tell you as well, you know, you, you have a complication of getting CSF leak and we tend to repair it. But if you have somebody with a defect in the skull base and they're going to use some positive pressure ventilation post-job, that's not a good thing to do because they can then cause the, a, a dam, sort of uh, 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 disrupt your repair and then lead to pneumocephalus and further CSF leak. So these are all complications one would anticipate in such cases. Um, and also many of these patients may uh, may have some ICD or some implant put in, which might preclude having MR, MRI scan. That's another complication in such patients. And even if you have uh, some patients with a pacemaker, MRI compatible pacemaker, they can be done only in certain MRI centers. So there are a lot of uh, complexities in patients with uh, significant cardiac morbidity with acromegaly. Sinan, anything more to add, Sinan? No, yeah, I, I quite agree with that, particularly the point about CSF leaks and CPAP. Another thing is that um, in these surgeries, we like to try and keep the blood pressure relatively low. And in someone who's usually normal tensive, even some people who are slightly hypertensive, uh, we like to run the systolic between 80 and 100. So, you know, if you have got um, people who have impaired cardiac function, you know, you're running a risk of running them that low. But if you run them in the 130s, 140s, you make it very difficult for yourself uh, because or rather your anesthetist makes it difficult for you because you've got quite a lot of bleeding in the operative field. Yeah. Um, so you often we compromise and we try and run it down to a certain level where there's a good balance between what we think is a good cardiac output and, and, um, and minimal bleeding uh, within. And often they're on one or several antihypertensives and it can be quite hard for the anesthetist to control. Uh, yeah, to good point. Uh, actually recently, I think last week or um, it was one of my patients that my registrar was operating um, with the ENT surgeon, and the patient blood pressure shot up to 200 and above, and there was some changes on the uh, ECG, there was some strain, and that was further uh, reviewed in the postoperative phase with some changes in the enzyme level. So we are now going to audit uh, the practice of using adrenaline, which uh, I need, as you know, I don't know whether you know, we sometimes use some adrenaline soaked patches inside the nose, not us, the ENT surgeon, try and reduce the the blood bleeding during the operation, yeah. uh, and that can adversely impact on the blood pressure and, and can significantly cause problems, and more so with these sort of high-risk patients. So these are all difficulties, mostly anesthetic issues and some surgical issues. Yeah. Gosh, thank you. That's really interesting. I didn't know about that, actually. And look, the majority of us are, are, are not surgeons, so that, that's a really interesting insight. I promised you all I would, I would with my, I crossed my heart, I think, and said that we would finish at 10 to 5, and it's 10 to 5. I wanted to thank all of you for your attendance, for your participation, particularly our neurosurgeons who added such an interesting element to it this afternoon. I'm so grateful. I know you've got lots of pressures on your time, but the contributions you've made this afternoon have been really interesting to the majority of us who aren't neurosurgeons, actually, and it really helps us to understand our pituitary patient's journey so much better. But thank you all for attending. And thank you particularly for our presenters because they've all done an amazing job this afternoon. Thank you for your attention. This is the QR code for your all important CPD. And we really hope to see you face to face um, next September for the masterclass at Charing Cross. So thank you all um, and see you soon. Take care. And that's from Karim and I. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. I'll leave that up. Just to say, before we go, we are hoping to have a meeting in December, that uh, Fausto's meeting that we think will be face-to-face, -face, fingers crossed, on December the 3rd, so I'll just advertise that. And lastly, when you do your uh, um, QR code and put your feedback, at the end of it, I'll just warn you, it will then take you to my petition, okay, automatically. So it just makes it easy for you to please do it.
Yes, a very important petition, so please do uh, get involved. Thank you.